Good. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the City of Palm Coast City Council business meeting this evening. It is Tuesday, July the 5th, 2022. It is 6 p.m., and we are in the community wing of City Hall. With that, I would um, ask you all to please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. If the uh, the clerk would uh, please call the roll. Mayor Alpin. Present. Vice Mayor Branquino. Here. Council Member Danko. Here. Council Member Finelli. Present. Council Member Klupas. Present. Mayor Let me just make it, thank you, um, and make a note that uh, City Council um, is attending by uh, Zoom virtually this evening and will pipe in, so we will listen. If necessary, I will make a motion if, uh, or <laughs> a hand motion, if, uh, if city council uh, councilor needs to weigh in on something to make sure that we have the, the flow. So just to let the audience know. With that, um, we will begin the meeting with our customary public participation. So in order for city staff to be able to respond to your questions or concerns, please fill out a comment card with your contact information. The comment cards can be found on the table near the agendas or from the table in the back where all of the directors are seated. Public participation shall be held in accordance with section 286.0114 Florida statutes and pursuant to the city council's meeting policies and procedures, each speaker shall at the podium provide their name and may speak for up to three minutes. The public may provide comments to the City Council relative to matters not on the agenda at the times indicated in this agenda. Following any comments from the public, there may be discussion by the City Council. When addressing the City Council on specific enumerated agenda items, speakers shall direct all comments to the Mayor, make their comments concise and to the point, not speak more than once on the same subject and not by speech or otherwise delay or interrupt the proceedings or the peace of the city council. Obey the orders of the mayor or the city council and not make any irrelevant, impertinent, or slanderous comments while addressing the city council, which pursuant to council rules shall be considered disorderly. <clears throat> any person who becomes disorderly or who fails to confine his or her comments to the identified subject or business shall be cautioned by the mayor and thereafter must conclude his or her remarks on the subject within the remaining designated time limit. Any speaker failing to comply as cautioned shall be barred from making any additional comments during the meeting and may be removed as necessary for the remainder of the meeting. So with that, I would open up the um, podium for public comment, so please step forward and uh, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? I uh, my name is Shirley Navarro. I live at the Senior um, Housing, Central Landing Senior, and um, I'm a tenant there. Um, I'm bringing a complaint um, in reference to Kelly Acker. The, uh, she's the community director where I live at. Um, I do wanna to bring to your attention this evening that um, as a senior, I really find it um, disturbing for uh, someone to put my financial papers when recertifying on the door with no envelope. It shouldn't even be on the door, period. Um, she requests us then to return it to her office and then denies us the opportunity to have a copy of it. Um, secondly, um, she takes and um, then says, this is, when questioned, this is corporate policy. Uh, thirdly, she has to sign affidavits for uh, tax exemption things without being really explaining. And then after that, she has to sign it 
Genesis copies, and then when I looked at it, I'm like, it has her, no she's a notary, it was notarized, I did not have knowledge that it was going to be notarized, I had no knowledge that she was the notary that was with her stamp stamping the document. Very interesting. Fourthly, preventive maintenance is done um, whenever they decide to do it. And um, so they have a list, and I have the documents here to show. They have a list of services that they're supposed to provide us. However, they are not provided. They usually just come in and change the, the filter of the air conditioner. I'm asthmatic. I'm allergic to mold. My air conditioner has a history of getting mold, and they're aware of this. And I usually ask them to please take and um, take the water out via a vacuum from the air conditioners, for those that know about air conditioners. And um, you had to put a work order. Work order was placed and spoken to, to her personally. I had last uh, Thursday a dental appointment. I requested, can you please come when I am there? I do not give permission for someone to be in my apartment unless it's an emergency in my apartment without me being present. Of course, we know there's histories of situations that happen with maintenance workers, and um, also because the work is not done that is supposed to be done, um, I want to be there to be sure that it's accomplished at least the needs that my apartment has. So today I just want to say thank you to you all for the opportunity bringing. I'm hoping that someone here will be able to start advocating and helping us in addressing what is going in, uh, thank you for your, thank you very much for your comment. City Manager, you have a note? Okay. Um, next speaker, please. My name is Celia Puglisi, and I live uh, in Palm Coast since 1991. I really appreciate you letting me speak, and I also appreciate the USA, a wonderful <laughs> country that had its birthday yesterday and also let me speak. Okay, um, I am bringing today again an issue that is very pressing for two homeowners association. One street, uh, Carson Park State, um, also uh, Lake Forest uh, homeowners association, 53 and 38 homes each. Also, uh, we have a nursing home, Brookdale, and we do have a gas station uh, three lots away and also we have the community of Courtney Lane, uh, where a plan, until now a plan project to put a 150 feet cell tower, diamond tower communication for cell, is going to need a special exemption from our residential original master plan. That tells that is wrong. It's the wrong location. It's a small parcel where it's going to be sitting, which is the utility parcel. That is a small parcel, and in that parcel, which I have a photograph, there is a large, brand new, it costs us like $800,000, uh, sewer leaf station. That sewer leaf station takes care of our black waters in the area. Uh, also, the tower, who's gonna, who's gonna insure that tower? I learned from the EPA that if the tower sits on the, our utility parcel, the utility, which is us, which pay for our utility rates, will be liable for any damages if that tower were to be hit by a hurricane, fall, or any of the parts on top of the tower will be blown into people's 150 feet away homes, windows. Or uh, also, if the tower will fall, we might lack, we might have a spill of that sewer that will also uh, contaminate the land, and it's very expensive to clean. Another thing that we found out, our homes around that tower, there are statistics found that when a tower comes up like that, the buyers or interested, interested uh, renters of those homes, they are 96% not looking to buy or rent in those homes. Is the city gonna pay us for the loss of value of our homes? That's another thing which is very serious. And uh, like I said, that sewer uh, uh, um, lift uh, station, 
for our sewer was replaced no long ago. We'll be liable with, this, with our uh, utilities for any damages. And we have a, 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 um, a gas station three lots away with the gas pumps there. So the city needs to reconsider this location. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, the next speaker, please. Curtis Stone, uh, 63 Simmon Drive. The people on Simmon Drive have asked me to come down. We've noticed you've put more signs up on the street, uh, share the road. We'll state what we stated from the very beginning. It's not helping. People come down that street, they hug the left lane, you know, where the yellow line is. There's nowhere to walk. If the grass is wet, you're going to get slippery. Also, you put a school sign up, be cautious, school bus, there's a tree covering the sign. Now, you can barely see it. And additionally, um, the, um, a lot of potholes in the street now on Simran, a lot of constant traffic. In addition to that, people are still don't understand why you can't paint the curb like they do on Palm Coast Harbor. Just give a little walking space, a little bike room. And that's about it. But we do appreciate the signs. I don't think it's helping, they don't think it's helping. I'll stay there seven years ago and make the same statement. Someone's going to get killed on that street. And then you're going to have a major problem. Thank, Thank you. you for your comment. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Robin McDonald, Palm Coast. You know, I've been coming to these meetings for probably six, seven years, and I've seen shows that if we could have sold popcorn, we would have made thousands of dollars. They were disastrous. But yet there was meetings where the sitting council was productive, was professional, they respected each other inside the room, and that's the way it should be, okay? Now we've got some major issues coming up in the city between housing, uh, police, um, schools being overcrowded. You know, I know all of you guys, and I voted for you, and I'll vote again for you if you're crazy enough to run. But you got to remember one thing. Whatever your attitude is towards each other, Leave it at that door. Leave it at that door. When you come in here, this is sacred land. This is like a firehouse or a church. This is sacred land. People sweated and died to put this building up. And we put you all there because you were the best of the best. Just like when the city hires somebody. They only hire the best. We don't get second best to third best, we only get the best. So all I'm asking is, we're gonna have some turnovers very shortly with some council people. We want to make this city the best city in the state of Florida. And it's up to all of you, not, not these people, because we don't have a say in anything. We have to depend and respect you for what you are, and that's all I'm asking. Do the job that we elected you to do, put your personal feelings about each other outside, and when you come in here, it's like you're like God to us, and we respect you. We may not agree with you. Ask Councilman Eddie. <laughs> we may not agree with you, but I still respect every one of you for sitting there. And I'll defend my, your right to sit there and represent what's best for the city of Palm Coast. That's all I'm asking. Thank you for your comment. Is there another member of the public that would like to comment to city council at this time? Yes, sir. Hello, Mr. Mayor. Um, Paul Varga. 
Fargo, 21 Colorado. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, and I brought this <clears throat> up before, uh, and this is in reference to the seawall at the condominiums uh, over on Clubhouse Drive. Um, I did come up with the complaint. It is uh, litigation in court. Uh, I'd like to present this uh, at the end here. And uh, what I have is um, back in some of the history on that was uh, the wall was completed and a final inspection was, was made by the city of Palm Coast in August of 2010. Uh, in 2016, a 50-foot section started listing and going towards the canal, 45-degree angle. Um, today, that is probably more like 300 feet, 350 feet of that wall. The entire wall is 1,840 feet, and it's in dire need of some repair. It's in the courts. There's another case, there's another hearing coming up, I think at the end of July, if nothing's changed, okay? There were some concerning things that the contractor did, okay? It, this is Palm, Palm Club Association Incorporated versus S.E. Klein Construction Incorporated. <clears throat> so there were some questionable things that he did to the repair and the building of the seawall. Um, they were going through it, they were starting to do some of the repairs, but then they came up with something else, another concerning fact uh, that is in the complaint, and, it it, and it's um, in reference to asbestos. So as soon as they found the asbestos, the job stopped, understandably, they didn't do it. Now, that again is 2016, 2018, Four years later, the wall is still like that. We're still not, um, it doesn't look like it's even being close to being completed. But I was wondering if the council or somebody is paying special attention to this case, <coughs> excuse me, because of, this, because of the asbestos involved. Um, there is a list of repairs on the complaint but it does not include the asbestos problem. I don't know how much is there, I don't know what they found, uh, but maybe we need to put a number on that and it is concerning. Thank you for your comment. Yes, sir. If you just pass that to the clerk, thank you. Is there another member of the public that would like to speak to city council? Yes, sir. How you doing, my name is Dale Arnault. I'm originally from Jacksonville, Florida, but I live here in Palm Coast now. I run Winter Circle Youth Sports, and I come today to express myself about the need of a recreation center for the youth. Um, so we use middle school, we use high schools for our sports that we have, but there's a fight sometimes to get those facilities. Um, I understand there's a racquetball center being built, and there's pools that's, that's needed, but I'm wondering if there is a way that we can add a rec center for the kids, along with racquetball, along with a pool, so basically everyone is satisfied. Um, our passion, uh, we've been established for two years now, our passion has been youth sports. Um, we do travel ball, we do local, you know, local ball, but Growing up, I've always had that opportunity on the weekends, in the off season, to just go to a rec center, go to a YMCA, and be able to, to play. And that's what a lot of these kids need. Uh, people talk about the crime and you know the issues that's going on with a lot of the kids. I think that's a big part of it, is them needing somewhere, sort of an outlet for them. Um, I'm not gonna take up all the time, that's all I have, but thank you. We thank you for your comment. Is there a next speaker that would like to address City Council at this time? Yes, sir. Steve Carr, Palm Coast. Uh, the cell towers, when you're putting these thing, these uh, decorations up there to make them look like a tree, during a hur hurricane, who's going to be responsible for taking those down? Or, or would 
they sustain the winds of a hurricane. I'm just curious about that because it could become a projectile and it might, and, and it might be good to have somebody take them down before the hurricane gets here. Also, I just wanted to talk about uh, the city has some pretty good policies and directives and everything to help try to protect the residents, but when they do projects, one is ensure that the proposed land use and development do not adversely impact existing residents. Also in the staff report for projects, it says the proposed development must not create an unreasonable hazard or nuisance or constitute a threat to the general health, welfare, or safety of the city inhabitants. Also says it will not constitute a threat to general health, welfare, or safety of citizens. Those are all really good, but when you're doing project after project, when, when you're doing a project and, you, you're, and you're saying that this is not going to affect these re residents, and then you do another project and you say, these, this is not going to affect their residents. What happens when those two projects actually do affect the residents? Where do the residents go to get that resolved? I mean, this project doesn't affect them, this project doesn't affect them, but having both of them done <coughs> does affect them. So just where do the residents go to get that resolved? Um, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public that would like to make comment on items that are not on the agenda? Please approach the podium. Good evening, George Mayo. Happy Fourth of July, a day late. Um, one thing, Mayor, when you address people and tell them about public participation, I wish you would also address, ask the people may forget to mute their phones, as we've seen a couple instances tonight. Have them just remember mute the phones to not interrupt the proceedings. Thank you. Um, also, I see in the agenda, July is uh, Parks and Recreation Month. And my wife and I, using Frida Zamba Pool, just want to give kudos to the uh, staff that's over there at the pool. Uh, they take care of the place. They keep it neat. They keep it clean. They keep it orderly. They don't let anything go on that shouldn't go on. And uh, the lifeguards are extremely attentive. They aren't out doing something else. So we just want to give thanks to all the employees over there. They do an excellent job. Also want to give kudos to the Public Works Department because they keep the esplanade, the streets, and, this, and the courts and everything, all the grass cut neat. When you leave Palm Coast and you go to Volusia, or we, today we went north, we had to go to St. Augustine, and you look at the esplanades, and the grass isn't cut, and it's trash all over the place so again thanks they do it on a regular basis I saw them cutting today so thank you to the Public Works Department they do an excellent job um, one other thing you did an excellent job last night with the fireworks uh, it was really interesting it was good but I'm wondering I see more and more on TV uh, towns cities especially out west are using drones instead of fireworks for the possibility of uh, forest fires brush fires I know the fireworks also scare the hell out of people's pets, and it causes a lot of animals distress. And you also have the possibility of an accident with them, and you also have the trash, the paper, the soot that comes down from fireworks. So I'm wondering in the future, I don't know what the cost is, if the city could look into maybe um, dr having drones instead of fireworks, whether it's cost efficient, the same, less, I don't know. But I've seen them on TV, and they've showed them in, in depth. And some of these drone shows are absolutely amazing. So maybe we could look into that uh, you know, for all those reasons. And uh, that's all I have tonight. Thank well, you. Well, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to address City Council at this time for any item that is not on the agenda? Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, Al Cryer is my name, uh, on the Committee on Safety on Cimarron. And uh, last time, uh, I, I've given Virginia 
something for the permanent file. At a recent meeting, you had asked us to get back on Cimarron and poll the people again to see if there were any changes in attitude, any new thinking, etc. And uh, there's been quite a bit of ownership change there and everything. And I just thought I'd, uh, the first page pretty much covers what we talked about last time. Safety is our number one issue. We want to try to make it a workable community. Uh, we've got one survey in already of over 600, but the survey that you asked for uh, mainly covers the people that have property on Cimarron, and I thought it was an excellent idea. And you wouldn't leave me off the hook. I wanted to only do one side where the sidewalk was going to be on, and I'm kind of glad that we did the whole thing because it's 75 houses. We looked at it, we said, hey, if we do 20 a day, uh, temperature was about 92 degrees, so nobody <coughs> froze to death. But the second page that I have in here, we basically took Cimarron, the 1.2 miles, and we broke it down into four sections. Uh, and the eastern sections are right around the sanctuary, and then down the the 90 degree turn, uh, everything south of there, uh, one and two zones are up on top, three and four are down the Palm Coast, and we also put in a fifth uh, uh, zone this time because there's a lot of people that live on uh, the Cedar Streets, the Century, that they don't have driveways on Cimarron, but they have considerable property on Cimarron. So we wanted to talk to everybody, uh, and it amounted to 77 calls. We went house to house. If you turn into the next sheet, I've got it broken down by zones here, and we won't go through each separate zone. But it totaled out, and I was just, it was just, it was just a lady. It was just so encouraging. Uh, we made 75 house to house calls, 66 people are strongly in favor of the sidewalk. We only had uh, six people. Uh, there was uh, actually, I put by uh, six people that made an objection. So uh, on the other side, uh, and, and the other side, uh, we had three houses for sale. So when you boil this whole thing down, uh, and some of your sheets may only show uh, three objections, I got a couple in the mail afterwards, but then again, I had five or six others that came in, said, hey, we signed the first petition, we missed you this time. So it kind of balanced out. But that's basically it. 90, 90 plus percent favored it, and it was very Thank encouraging, and all you people helped in moving it this far. So Thank you for your okay. comments. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would like to address City Council at this time? Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, Dan Bryant from uh, Crossgate Court. And this is just a continuation a little bit of the uh, on Cimarron. Just a couple things that came up. I, when we, uh, I'm on the uh, Safety on Cimarron Committee and we were uh, actually very pleased with the results that we got talking to people in the community. Actually a little bit of surprise too. I, this, I was uh, actually thinking it would have been a tougher putt than it was, but we had 11 to one uh, in favor of having a uh, sidewalks and even some of the houses which we were expecting that people have essentially circle driveways where they would have two crossings of the sidewalk. They were even more in favor of it because they're, they know how scary it is to pull, to back out on the Cimarron. And they uh, like the idea of having a, uh, a property which is walkable uh, and living in a community that is walkable and allows everyone to connect. So uh, I was just going to leave a uh, comment note. Uh, where we are right now, uh, we, uh, from the timeline that was proposed, uh, the consultants uh, have done their, done their job. I assume that their statement of work has been completed. Uh, I don't know if any, uh, if part of that statement of work included uh, assessing whether or not there could be any ancillary funding that could come from any groups or not, but I 
We certainly hope that that was part of the statement of work. And largely just uh, we would like to, on the committee, get back to the residents to maintain the engagement across the community. But right now, we don't really have any information to, to uh, relay to them. So uh, you could please uh, keep us informed if there's anything else we can do to expedite this and to uh, encourage the creation of a timeline and a budget, either through reallocation or through uh, some other method. We would appreciate it. Thank you much. Thank you for your comment. Any additional members of the public would like to comment to city council members at this time for any item that it's not on tonight's agenda? Seeing none, I will close public comment and come back to city council. Are there any city council members that would like to comment on? Just, just one thing. Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I'd just like to answer, talk directly to my friend, Bob McDonald. Uh, good friend. But he, there's one thing, uh, uh, and I have to admit that at times this was pretty bad, and I probably won at fault for that. But that door on this side or on the other side, I'm still the same person. My feelings are the same out there as they are here. Fortunately, we have a thing called sunshine law. I cannot talk with my colleagues outside unless it's, we're talking about cars and other things. So if there's something that I have to tell my colleagues, I'll say it here in front of everybody, good or bad or indifferent but I will tell them to their faces like I expect them to tell me. So I think my colleagues also think the same way I do, but the same way I'm up there, I'm here with all due respect. Any other members of city council like to comment at this time? <clears throat> if I may just comment about the cell phone towers. Uh, Councilman Klufus, welcome back. Hey, thank you very much, I appreciate it. It's great to be back. Uh, the one comment I had about the cell phone towers, uh, back in 2016 when we established the wireless master plan, we eliminated um, the requirement to have fake tree limbs attached to the maximum height of 100 foot monopoles. And we went to the industry standard of 150 foot monopoles for uh, center line distribution and, and we no longer have those tree limbs that are required. That was a big impediment for uh, telecom infrastructure people, they hate that. So just in the future, there's not going to be any cell phone towers that look like trees. Any other members of city council comment at this time? I do. I'd, I'd Councilman like Finelli. To, I'd like to address Mr. Cryer, Mr. Bryant, um, for citizens on Cimarron. Thank you guys for continuing to seek solutions and, and provide us with the, the feedback we need to make good decisions. Um, you guys are, are in my district, and um, I will work with Ms. Bevan to see what the next steps are, and I'll get back with you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. With that, we will move forward, and uh, I will <clears throat> ask for a motion regarding the minutes of the City Council uh, for June the 21st, 2022, a business meeting, and also June the 28th, 2022, a special budget meeting. I'd ask for a motion now. I have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Does the clerk have the count? Motion Thank you. We move forward under the proclamations and presentations. We have one sole proclamation this evening. Uh, Councilman Klufus will proclaim July as Parks and Recreation Month. So please. Parks and recreation systems are dedicated to enhancing the quality of life for millions of residents in communities around the world through recreation programming and conservation efforts. And whereas parks, trails, and recreation activities provide opportunities for both young and older members of the community alike to create continuous life experiences. And whereas parks, trails, and recreation activities generate opportunities for people to come together and experience a sense of community. And whereas Parks, trails, and recreation activities pay dividends to communities by attracting businesses, jobs, and increasing house values. And whereas the city of Palm Coast recognizes the vital contributions of employees and volunteers in parks and recreation facilities. And whereas these dedicated supporters keep parks clean and safe for visitors, 
organize activities for all ages, and advocate for additional amenities. And whereas parks and recreation staff are innovative and creative, ensuring Palm Coast residents have opportunities to explore, connect, and play in our city. Now therefore be it proclaimed by the mayor and the city council of the city of Palm Coast, Florida, that the month of July be officially designated as Parks and Recreation Month. Be it further proclaimed that we hereby request that during Parks and Recreation Month that all citizens explore, connect, and play in Palm Coast by taking part of their, of their favorite sports, visiting the outdoors, and spending time with family and friends. Signed this fifth day of July, 2022, City of Palm Coast, Florida, Mayor David Alphen. And before you begin, let me just make a comment. <clears throat> I have had so many compliments and wonderful um, um, feelings about the extravaganza that we all enjoyed to celebrate the, uh, the birth of our country, that you all are a foundational pillar in making that happen. Not everybody here understands the blood, sweat, and tears that went on for months that each of you worked so hard, and the result was phenomenal, a historic event in the city of Palm Coast. So my personal congratulations, and from city council as well. Absolutely. All right, well, Mayor, city council, thank you for your continued support. Uh, we actually have a presentation, so I'll jump into the presentation, and then we have a really cool video at the end. And presentation kind of goes through our achievements. Uh, these guys are amazing at what they do. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have parks and recreation. So, but we'll go through. I have a little bit of a presentation. So, thank you. Can't do it. So yeah, this presentation is kind of, we're going to go through each of our divisions. Um, we're going to talk about all the really fantastic achievements our staff has done over the last year or so for Parks and Recreation and for the community. So July's Park and Rec Month has been celebrated since 1985. Uh, it is to promote, to, it, is, it is used to promote and build strong, vibrant and resilient community, communities through the par power of parks and recreation and to recognize more than 160,000 full-time park and rec professionals, along with hundreds of thousands of part-time seasonal workers and volunteers uh, that maintain our country's local, state, and community parks. So we are Parks and Recreation here at the City of Palm Coast. Uh, we offer recreational programs for all ages, and we oversee the Palm Harbor Golf Court Club, the Tennis Center, Palm Coast Aquatic Center, the Palm Coast Community Center, Indian Trail Sport C Complex and more than a dozen scenic parks. Uh, then we also have and coordinate 75 special events annually. So this is our crew. Uh, we have obviously one director, we have one manager, uh, three people within our athletics department, eight people in our field maintenance area, nine lifeguards and supervisors at the aquatic center, 11 parks and trails maintenance crew, 11 people at the tennis center, 18 uh, staff members at the co golf course, and then 25 uh, staff at the community center. That includes our summer camp that just started in June. Uh, so what do we, here's some of the achievements uh, our aquatics team did. Uh, these guys are safety first. So internally we trained six lifeguards. Uh, we trained swim instructors, and then also our supervisor, Ali, she trains our staff in CPR and first aid through the American Red Cross. Um, they've, over the year, they taught, they taught over 610 swim lessons, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, they do a great job. Um, and then we're also, every year we work with the Wadsworth STEM program. Uh, they come over to the pool, they learn some lifeguard skills, uh, they learn some swimming, uh, which Ali and the team helps with. And then we have Duel in the Pool, which is coming up pretty soon. And it's our youth swim team versus the Sheriff Powell swim team. And so it's really cool for the kids who are moving into high school on swim teams know how, to use, how, to, how a swim meet works. This is trying to introduce them into swim meets. Uh, our athletics department, uh, 
Every year we have the NCCAA over at Holland Park. Uh, so this year we had 119 kids trained with collegiate athletes, and this is a free program for everyone. Uh, we had offered eight pickleball tournaments, and this is a real big one for us. We hosted our first ever women's basketball league. Uh, this was really good. We, we got three teams, which is good, but in the stands we had 50 to 100 people spectating. And I think every night we have it, more people join. So it's, it's getting there, and this is a really good achievement by our staff here. Uh, golf, we got the new, new fleet of golf carts. Uh, and we celebrated our fifth course's 50th anniversary, a lot, and that was in partnership with the Historical Society. So that was cool. And then we also got to host our first toddler program, Mini Golfers. Uh, you can see here Mitch down in the bottom left helping out there with the Mini Golfers. Uh, they got to the, not only learn golf, but they got to learn the equipment as well, and they were excited to see some tractors and stuff like that. Uh, tennis. Uh, George, our new supervisor over the tennis center, has actually created a high performance program, uh, which is we're hoping to develop competitive plays here in Palm Coast. So they stay in Palm Coast to do, ta do high performance lessons with George. Uh, and so we're hoping instead of them going down the Daytona or anything, they stay in Palm Coast and get the best possible coaching they can. And George is obviously very well qualified at that. Uh, we're partnering again with the PAL for offering new local youth programs in tennis. And then just uh, recently in March, we hosted the Florida Area Games for the Special Olympics. So we had 30 to 40 athletes come out between, I think it was at seven counties or within seven, seven counties. And they came and used our tennis center for a little tennis tournament. So that was cool as well. Uh, our parks and trails, uh, they, we installed our emergency trail system along uh, St. Joe's walkway. So it stands from the trailhead of the community center all the way to St. Joe's uh, bridge, uh, sorry, uh, Hammock Bridge. Uh, they also replaced many of the wooden bridges at Linear Park that uh, were needed to be repaired. And then uh, for the Starlight Festival, along with just not parks and trails, but our whole team came together and we created the Charlie Brown Christmas float, which actually won the fan favorite and it had snow coming out and everything. I'm not sure if anyone saw it, but it was really cool. The guys and girls did a fantastic job helping out and they had fun working on it. Uh, our sport fields. So we hosted the 2021 Under 12 Little League State Championships, was a, which it was an amazing success. Uh, the guys worked hard every day, 14 hour shifts, um, to keep the fields pristine. And Dennis and his crew, they do that every day of the week, and they're really good at what they do. Uh, we facilitated 25 tournaments and uh, at the sport complex as well. Uh, at our community programs, uh, we've hosted just over 1,700 campers in the last year. We've held two, 450 programs and just shy of 30,000 residents attending those programs. We've had 1,300 facility rentals and then we've partnered with Daytona State College to host multiple nursing, uh, nursing students come and do kind of like health screening here at the community center. Um, our amazing marketing team, uh, they, the world's largest swim lesson, uh, we got, we got our, one of our photos selected for that international marketing campaign, which was really cool. It was a really good photo. Uh, and then we also, another photo was selected for the NRPA's July Parks and Rec Month national campaign as well. Uh, and then our marketing team did help with the Women's Basketball League, and we shared it with regional media outlets such as Orlando Click and Daytona, Daytona Journal. Uh, so our special events, uh, so we've had, we donated 2,500 to local charities and beneficiaries. Uh, we hosted our first annual fire truck pool, which we won. Uh, the, our Palm Coast Fire Department won that one, just so everyone knows. And then our, we sent a team to the first ever FRPA eSports tournament. So we had a group of local kids who did, did an eSport event with us and they qualified for the state team, uh, state, state team, state championships, and we sent that team down and did pretty well. Uh, we have a couple of numbers here. Uh, so we've had, just as I said, 1,700 campers, uh, 370 pickleballers. Uh, we have a tennis ball recycle program, which have, we've recycled just shy of 14,000 tennis balls. Uh, and then we just had over 50,000 rounds of golf over at the golf course. Uh, and then this is just, our staff and the amazing achievements they have done. Um, I don't know if the mouse works. No. So on the top left we had Rodney, and the bottom left we have Mike. Uh, they got their CPSI certification, which is they can. Uh, it's for playground safety 
Uh, so this is very necessary for all the playgrounds in the, that we have in the city. Uh, we've had Shannon, she's, uh, she got certified as a, a swim instructor for the first time. She's one of our first swim instructors this year. Uh, Ali, I've mentioned her before, but she also got her master's coaching certification. Uh, and then down the bottom, we have Jojo uh, for pickleball. Uh, he got his certification in uh, pickle, teaching lessons for pickleball. So uh, all our staff is amazing, and they continue to surprise me every day. But, and then this is what we got over the next, um, next month. So we had the round robin just happened this week, and also the fireworks. Uh, don't miss movies in the park. Uh, July 9th, we have our eSports tournament for FIFA. Uh, we're doing a paddle at Princess Place. You now we got our normal food truck Tuesday and our July art festival. I uh, believe food truck Tuesday we might see BMXs come out and do some tricks, so that make sure you hit, hit that one, that'll be a good one. Uh, we've got our Sport Alliance Clinic, so it's a free program. It will be for anyone, uh, our, any kids, they want to come out and learn any sport, soccer, uh, football, anything like that. Our Sport Alliance members have, just, have graciously given their time up to teach some kids some, uh, some of their sports. Uh, then on July 30th over at Holland Park, we've got Papa Palooza, which will be fun, so bring your puppies. And then don't forget our Wednesday walks, which I think our first one is tomorrow. Uh, and that will be at Linear Park, so we'll probably meet at the community center and head down Linear Park. And that's it, I'll just quickly show us uh, the video. We are the storytellers. We inspire discovery. We're competitive. We keep our city beautiful. We're silly. We're guardians of the future. We set the stage for greatness. We bring people together. We're educators. We love friends of all kinds. We believe in the power of fun. We explore. We connect. We play. We are Parks and Recreation. And we rise up to the challenge of a fun new day. Very nice presentation. The only thing I missed was I didn't hear you throw down the challenge to those that live on the beach side that you're going to win the surfing competition uh, next year. Yeah, I am uh, might have to go nationally for that one too. So, uh -huh. yeah. But thank you. All right, that concludes your presentation. So once again, just a, a round of applause for Parks and Rec. This is the group that provides that component of lifestyle that we talk about, that we try to preserve, that is all important. That's why so many of us chose to move and live here in Palm Coast. So thank you again, everyone. Our next presentation is on the Smithsonian Waterways, which is really a unique and very special event. Council members, good evening to you, Ms. Sheikh, Ms. Smith, good evening. My name is Sybil Dodson Lucas, and I am a board member and the curatorial director at the African American Cultural Society of Palm Coast, Florida. And I'm here this evening to bring great news to you about the onset and the opening of our Smithsonian Waterways exhibit. And the big 
big, big deal about that is that the Smithsonian Institution, now known as the Smithsonian, is uh, coming to a small town, not so small a town anymore, like Palm Coast. So we're delighted to be designated as a museum on Main Street and bringing this first representation from the Smithsonian called Waterways. And I'll be reading along, if, if, with your permission, the African American Cultural Society Incorporated was one of several, seven organizations actually selected out of more than 300 that applied to be awarded a grant to host waterways in Florida. We have contracted with Touchpoint Initiative Solutions of Florida, of Palm Coast, to assist with outreach to Putnam, St. John's, Volusia, Duval, and neighboring counties throughout Florida. Waterways is part of a museum on Main Street, a unique collaboration between the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Services, State Humanities Council across the nation, and local host institutions. AACS, the African American Cultural Society, African American Museum and Cultural Center, is proud to be a Smithsonian Museum on Main Street host this year. This is a first time for us, first time in this part of the country, and we could not be more proud and pleased to bring it to you. Waterways explores the centrality of water in our lives, including its effect on the environment and, and climate, its practical role in agriculture and economic planning, and its impact on culture and spirituality. And I will say to you, all of you, if you've not um, been aware of it, that water plays such an important role in all of our lives. We're more keenly aware of it sometimes here in Florida because we are right here blessed with this beautiful ocean right at our footsteps or outside our door. But we'll also bring to your attention that water has part of been part of the spiritual practices of many cultures, including the African culture. So that you're aware, I'm sure, uh, May Alpin, of the uh, libation ceremony that we hold in most of our practices at the African Museum, uh, at the African American Cultural Society. Also, Native Americans use water in their spiritual practices. And our Jewish brothers and sisters use water, as do our Christian brothers and sisters when we think of baptism. So water is an integral part of all that we do. Concurrent events of local art, artifacts, speaker presentations, performances, festivals, and education workshops for children will be held during our eight-week exhibition. The exhibition dates run from July 9th through September 3rd, and that's gonna be held right at our, our location. We own our beautiful building on US Highway 1 North, and I'm gonna invite you, of course, our city council representatives and your audience to join us at that activity. The tickets are free, and they're available at aacsmuseum.org waterways. And if anyone didn't get that, they certainly can call out to the center or call here to the city and get more information. The July 9th opening day and ribbon cutting will consist of festivals, weekly water safety demonstrations and classes, weekly themes and speakers, speakers including a family's history along the St. John's River. Don't rock the boat, rock the mic. Video presentation by area students from our local schools, including my granddaughter. Hydrotherapy from a patient's perspective. Weekly movie night at the museum. Story time for preschoolers. September 3rd, Waterways closes with Marine Land Dolphin Adventure and the Pirates Invasion. So you can see it's something for everybody that we're bringing to the center and to the city. Our outreach plan included speaking here with you tonight, magazines, newspapers, radio spots, 
email marketing, programmatic displays, social media campaigns. And again, I invite each and every one of you and everyone in attendance here tonight to join us for this significant occasion. If you have any further questions for me, I'd let, be glad to entertain them at this point. Let me just um, make a comment. So we've been involved, I've been involved in this project for several years. I can't compliment you and your organization's members and staff enough. So for all of our folks in the audience and those who may be virtually attending the meeting this evening, this exhibit is coming from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., our capital. They have chosen Flagler County to be the recipient of a real live exhibit. There are pieces of that exhibit which will be shipped down from Washington to our location for our community to enjoy, but even more importantly, to learn. It would be, it would be less than important to say that water is our future gold. Water will become more important than gold, perhaps in some of our younger residents' lifetimes. Make no mistake about it. I think everybody up here on the dais understands that. Water will be the future, so I applaud you for bringing water and the history of water in our state um, for education to all of our residents. So we thank you very, very much. And we thank you, sir. And thanks for your continued support and your participation. We look forward to seeing you on opening night. You will, thank you. All right, thank you and thank all of you. Our next presentation this evening will be the 2022 Wyland National Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation Results. So off to a good start, Ms. Kershaw. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. We have a theme going on here with water tonight. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the National Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation. Um, the City of Palm Coast participated for the uh, 2022 challenge, and I am happy to say that we won first place for our population. Um, so what is the National Challenge? It is a friendly competition between cities in the U.S. to see who can be the most water wise. Um, mayors across the nation challenge their residents to find various ways to conserve water and energy. Um, and it, it's an online pledge that takes very little time to complete. And um, we had a, a big push in our community and they responded very well. <laughs> um, so the cities with the highest percentage of residents who take the challenge win. And from there, there's an extra incentive to take the challenge. Um, participants from those winning cities can win hundreds, if not thousands of dollars in prizes. And one nonprofit organization from a winning city will win a Toyota Highlander Hybrid. Um, so Mayor Alfin told us before we started this challenge that we pledged to be number one and that just ignited a passion in us to go ahead and try and make that happen. And it did. Um, for our population, which is 30,000 to just under 100,000 residents, uh, we were named most water wise. Yay. Yay. So the incredible community of Palm Coast uh, pledged to reduce plastic water bottle usage by nearly 120,000 bottles. Um, they pledged to eliminate 3,100 pounds of hazardous waste from entering the watersheds and uh, over 1.3 million pounds of waste in the landfills. So this saves a whole bunch of carbon dioxide, lots of energy, and um, a lot of money in consumer cost savings. So I'm very proud of my team. Um, I run the communications and marketing for the city of Palm Coast, and so um, my team was very energetic with this project. 
Um, our social media posts reached nearly 20,000 people. We had almost 2,000 people engaging with us on our post. They were shared many times, and we created seven uh, very interesting videos to share of, on this project as well. Uh, we were in the news. We had three news releases, um, which were published in four different um, media outlets. We reached out to all of our contacts, and we sent um, various emails to our email subscribers as well. In person, we were able to hand out flyers and talk to people about the challenge during four city council meetings in the month of April, three in-person events, and um, during five public speaking engagements. So they said that Palm Coast residents pl pledged to cut water use by 51 and a half million gallons, which is incredible. Um, so what's next? Residents from the winning cities, which includes Palm Coast, can win many prizes. In fact, we've actually heard from a few residents who have been notified that they have received prizes from participating in this challenge, so that's super cool. Uh, somebody will win $3,000 towards their annual home utility bills. And um, there's a bunch of prizes from eco-friendly um, products to gift cards. And um, there were three charities identified through this challenge that people were able to say where they wanted this Toyota Highlander hybrid um, donated to. And those three nonprofits in Palm Coast are the Flagler Humane Society, the Flagler County Art League, and the Palm Coast Volunteer Fire Rescue. So, um, that's three from this city. There are three from each of the winning cities, and one of them overall will win. So those nonprofit organizations are able to kind of write a letter of why they should win that vehicle and what they would use it for. And then they will learn in August who wins that. So I thank you for your staff, for the energy they show. But the real winners in this competition are the residents. Every one of you in the audience, every resident of the city of Palm Coast. And there's a recurrent theme that at least I'm promoting and hopefully will catch on. And what I would tell you and your staff is look what we can do when we work together. There is just no limit. And I think this competition is just another example of look what we can do when we all work together. So thank you and your staff. Our next presentation, uh, our final presentation this evening, is the Flagler County School Planning Interlocal Agreement Update. So, gentlemen, bef while, they're, while they're setting up, um, you have uh, appointed uh, myself and Councilman Klufus to attend the um, interlocal the school concurrency interlocal committee, which will meet again this coming Thursday. Um, I will ask Councilman Klufus to be the spokesperson um, as I am the chair of that committee. Um, it is our challenge tonight to formulate a consensus which can then be um, shared with the committee on th at Thursday's meeting. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening. Uh, Ray Tyner, Deputy Chief Development Officer, and with me today is Senior Planner Jose Papa. And we actually are the staff liaison on what we call the, uh, the working group as part of the requirement of the interlocal uh, agreement. So we're here tonight to provide an update and hopefully uh, maybe some direction um, that, we, um, that, that, that would be provided to the Oversight Committee. But let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, the um, school concurrency itself was, um, became law in 2005, uh, and those requirements for state law is that local governments must adopt the public school facility element of the comprehensive plan, which we have done, uh, adopt a level of service, establish uh, proportionate share mitigation methodology, adopt an interlocal agreement um, to be implemented. Um, the School Facilities Planning Interlocal Agreement, or ILA, was um, the existing one was adopted in 2008, 
and the participants of that interlocal agreement was the city of Palm Coast, Flagler Schools, Flagler County, Bunnell, and Flagler Beach, based on their population, was added in 2020. Um, the interlocal agreement does establish a technical working group and an oversight committee. As I mentioned, um, city staff um, are part of the technical working group, and they have staff from each local government and the school district. They meet at least once per year. It's an open discussion that includes the public or any stakeholders who, who want to attend. And the purpose of this group is to recommend any changes agreed by consensus um, of the professional staff only, and they would um, make a recommendation to the oversight committee. The oversight committee is um, another committee that's required by the existing interlocal agreement, and that includes elected officials only. Um, two members from each uh, local government. There are three from Flagler Schools, um, and the role of the members are to discuss matters related to the interlocal agreement. And as the mayor mentioned, there was a, a first meeting on June 9th, um, this last month. And then describe and gain consensus from city council on any proposed change. And that's, that's why we're here today for, uh, for a discussion. Um, then the return to the committee for consensus building, which we would do to the working um, to the working group, uh, which the next meeting for the oversight committee is July 8th, as the mayor mentioned, and bring any, any final interlocal agreement would uh, then come back to city council for, for consensus or vote on the interlocal agreement. So there has been some changes in law. Uh, in 2011, the uh, Community Planning Act made school concurrency optional, but it still requires a level of service establishment and um, must be reviewed by all parties. In May 2nd, two, uh, 2022, uh, the Flagler County Board of County Commissioner voted to terminate and replace the current interlocal agreement. And that action takes, will be, um, effective date of that action would be August 31st, uh, 2022. So the current ILA that we have now, uh, it includes joint meetings, uh, requirements for joint meetings, discuss issues of mutual concern, uh, a coordination of, of planning activities. Um, it pursues opportunities for co-location and shared use facilities. Um, it coordination, coordinates uh, school siting uh, facilities. Uh, we talk about the planning process, review of school board work plans, uh, need of infrastructure needs, uh, coordination, the development of comprehensive plan, uh, public school facility elements that was mandated in 2005, and it requires a proportionate fair share mitigation payment process. So for several months, the working group has been working together um, on updating or making recommendations to the oversight committee regarding changes on the uh, interlocal agreement. And I do want to emphasize, uh, Mayor and City Council, that you know city staff has been part of these um, talks and dis discussions, and the um, the working group also has had a lot of um, uh, stakeholder groups. You know, some some uh, developer representation, some legal representation, and I will say that. Even though there may be, I, I think as, as we get in this a little bit, there is some philosophical difference on how to fund, you know, um, uh, the impact fees and pr prop share. But I, but I do want to make a statement through our experience, uh, staff, that you know everybody's interest in that working group is they want the best schools in Flagler County. I mean everybody, you know, all the stakeholders, the working group. It's just how how to get there and how to, how to make it happen. So the working group continues work uh, within the ILA. There continues to um, have a working group and oversight committee as part of the draft. Uh, continues coordination of planning activities. Continues with the pursuit of opportunities for co-location of facilities. Continues co coordination of school siting, ensuring that you know any school siting complies with each local government's comprehensive plan, land development code. 
And then there is an alternate proposal um, to the current prop share um, to uh, uh, mitigation uh, payment process. So what that is, right now we use, as part of the existing interlocal agreement, it's what we call uh, a prop share. You can see it on the left-hand column. And then another alternative to, to funding mechanism would be a capacity, what they're calling a capacity reservation fee. So two philosophical differences on how, how we get there. So on the left-hand side for the proportionate share, the payment of prop share is only when there's deficient capacity within the school system. The capacity reservation fee is a, is a fee that is paid at the time of approval, plat, site plan, regardless capacity. So the concept is you don't have capacity, you do prop share, then prop share would stop, but you will continue, um, even if there is capacity at our school, to continue to have a, um, a funding mechanism ahead of time. Um, the proportionate share on the left is, again, what we're currently using. It's negotiable as a percentage amount, but now the current draft is due in a three-year period, and that would be a payment of 40, 30, and 30. Forty percent up front of impact fees the first year, 30 percent of impact fees or equivalent the second year, and then 30 percent that, that third year. That's what we have now. That's what, well, not the 40, 30, 30. Um, right now, there are, this is what's proposed as far as the uh, proportionate fair share, that 40, 30, 30. Right now, they, the, the flagger schools might have used that now in, in some of their agreements that they're doing, but that's what they're proposing now as part of this, um, of, of this draft proposal. So, just so I understand, before any ground is broken, this is what they would pay up front? They would pay 40? this 40% would be up front. Um, typically, that would happen at final plat. So, you know, we have a three tiered process for a subdivision, would be a subdivision master bear. Plumbery plat, technically, they can start construction, putting in the earthworks in, uh, the utilities, the road base at, at that stage. But at final plat, that's when they would have to pay or come into an agreement with Flagler schools to pay 40% up front. And then 30 to second year. Almost half year. up front, right off the bat, basically. Yes, sir. So let's let, let's let's go get to the end of the presentation and just hold the hold the questions so we we get the rest of it so we can kind of compile our questions all together. So so the capacity reservation fee is 20 percent up front um, of the total impact fees, and that would that would be it a one shot 20 percent up front. On, on that fee. The, pro, the proportionate share impact fee credit is giving uh, for prop share payment. So total feed and prop share and reservation fee is the same, but with different timing. Same with the capacity reservation fee. Impact fees or credit is giving uh, for the reservation fee payment. So in essence, if your in, total impact fees, making this number up, is a you know a million dollars. Okay, no matter what, the Flagler schools will get a million dollars, won't exceed, as part of their prop share f plan, and with a capacity reservation plan, same thing. If if the impact fees are a million dollars, it cannot exceed the million dollars. It's a matter of timing on the on the two different formulas. So, the prop share. Um, we know it's a giving, it's been utilized, it's in state statute, um, and it follows the statutory requirement. For the capacity reservation fee, it's unknown at this time. Um, you know, our attorneys, and I'm sure the other attorneys too, will have to investigate that method of looking to see the, the legality of that. So again, the next step is you know, get city council input uh, to provide to the oversight committee members. And again, the oversight committee meeting uh, is July 8th and the ILA, interlocal agreement, anything that is uh, a final draft will return to the city council for approval and we don't have that date yet. So we're here to try to answer some questions. So Mr. Tyner, let, just, let, me, yeah, no, let me just kick it off here. 
Can you compose a question that would offer you the direction for staff that you're asking from city council? Um, or Mr. Papa, either one. I think, and, and Jose can add if you'd like to, but I think, again, there is a, a philosophical difference on the methodology on um, prop share versus um, the, the uh, reservation fee. Um, I think our attorneys will tell you, and I, and I think uh, NASA may be on, the reservation fee at this short period of time, we have looked into it, and, and um, but we just need direction right now on, you know, looking at the proportionate fair share to 40, 30, 30. I, I think one of our council members uh, had mentioned, wow, 40 up front. Do we do we go back if we if we stay with that methodology? Is it something that we look at as another alternative, not putting 40 down right there, 40% uh, up front? The current proposal for the prop share is a three-year period. Do we go to five and spread that out? You know, I think there's different alternatives if we stay with the proportionate fair share. But then again, you know, the other method that's unknown is, is the fee. So those are the type of, hope I answered your question. Okay. Um, uh, Mayor. Ms. Bogart, yes. NASA, do, do you mind if I, Please. If I insert myself here? So. And the, let me just start off by saying, um, you know, of course the city is in a position where it wants to work with the school district and the county and the other cities within the county to come to a mutually beneficial um, and consensus agreement as to how to proceed forward. And, and most provisions in the ILA are and have been agreed to, and I think that are they're they're good, they're moving, moving forward. This particular one is causing a sticking point because the capacity reservation fee is not something where there's a statutory matrix that sets out exactly how it's done. It's not in there. Um, it's something that has been pulled from one other county, my understanding is, and, and Sean Moylan, I believe, from, um, the Flagler County Attorney's Office is there and can provide more insight on this because um, he's been working on this proposal from the county. But some of the things that Sean and myself and Katie Reisman is talking about is how to get this cap, um, capacity reservation fee in a proposal in line with the statutory requirements, specifically the recent legislation, recent being in the last four to five years, concerning impact fees, timing of payment, um, that they're due at you know building permit time, which was a recent change rather than before that, um, and also how to establish when, how to, how, do you, um, how to be able to get there from capacity, if you're reserving capacity, that's inherently you should be over capacity when that happens, and how do we get to that point um, to be able to do that? So those are the, some of the things legally that we're just trying to work out, and we've been discussing this with Mr. Moylan and trying to understand better what that proposal is. So I think like Ray said, the question is, you know, I guess, what is the city council's feelings on the timing of these payments? Are there strong feelings? Is, does somebody have a, an idea of, of what they'd like to see or, or something like that? That's what we'd be interested in hearing, bringing that information back to um, the working group and to the oversight committee and then trying to really work on getting whatever proposal seems to be gaining more of consensus from the committee, how to get to a point where we can implement, implement that effectively from a legal standpoint. So um, is it fair to say that there are actually two questions simplifying it in what you just said? One being the, <clears throat> the phasing or the, the cash flow timeline, and the second question being the process or procedure one being reservation versus the other being an existing um, um, proportionate share procedure. So 
I just want to make it clear to City Council, I think those are the two questions that staff needs to hear and also that we would be, assuming we have consensus, be discussing at the ILA meeting on um, Thursday. So with that, um, I will just ask one thing. Would you like Mr. Uh, Councillor Moylan to come up to be available for questions? I, I, I just have a Go couple ahead. of things. I, I just have a couple of things Mr. Here. Mayor, if I could just first, because of my um, relationship with the school district, I'm going to recuse myself and I will not be part of the conversations and consensus regarding this matter. I so that's understand. known up front. I could understand. Thank and you. Uh, City Council, you have, uh, you have that on the record, that's okay? Yes, I've talked to Mr. to Councilmember Finelli about this, and it is acceptable. Thank you. Okay, everybody's got that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor to staff. This impact fees, one way or the other, they're still going to go to schools. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Completely. Yes. And I understand that this money. And here, I'm not 100% sure. This money must be used on new school infrastructure. Is that correct? For capacity. For capacity. Yes. Okay. Well, basically, what we have over here, it's uh, two questions. One, do we keep it proportional as uh, giving them 40, 30, and 30? Or we uh, go to the <coughs> reserva uh, capacity reservation, which is only 20% up front. Now, the question here is that we're still going to have to give them the money. Now, there are other people out there, like builders and uh, I don't know if other, other partners in this, like the Home Builders Association. For example, I'm just throwing one out there. Uh, uh, and they, their members, they're going to have to pay up front 40% if we keep this as a lump sum. And as much as I love schools, and I do, trust me, is this fair to the, to the people on the Home Builders Association? So, I don't know, here I, I probably looking more for direction than actually giving direction regarding one of these two uh, 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 questions over here. But I think that's the only two questions we have. Either we go uh, uh, with 20% uh, capacity reservation or we go with a lump sum is 40, 30, 30. That's, that's basically what we have over here. Yeah, Councilman I, Danko. I, I find this 40, 30, 30 very steep. And to me, this is like the uh, federal government coming to you at the beginning of the year and saying, hey, you haven't worked a day yet, but we'd like you to pay 40% of your taxes now. And then we'll come back in the middle of the year, we'll get 30, and then we'll get 30 at the end. This just seems to be too much of a burden. Um, I would be more in favor of something like 20, 20, 20, 20, and 20. So yeah, you could start with 20% up front. And then after 20% of construction is completed or homes are sold or whatever the measurement you want to use, you get another 20% and so on and so forth until at the end of the day, the project is finished and here's your remaining 20%. And, le and let's keep in mind that the, all of this money, these impact fees, obviously are passed along to the buyers of those homes. Um, but to ask someone for 40% upfront, I think that's way too steep. And I would like to see us do something a little more spread out. I built a house uh, once, I hired a contractor, and I gave him 20% down. He completed 20% of the work, I gave him another 20%. Finally, at the end of the day, the house was finished, he got his remaining 20. So, so that's where I sort of stand on this. And I, I did have one question about our schools, uh, our capacity. Our, our, how much have our school population increased in the last few years? Do we know? I believe that there's been a slight increase, but uh, it, it hasn't, shall we say, boomed. It hasn't boomed. Right? The, 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 the issue we're having now is that uh, with, with, the new, with the approvals of new development, uh, right. new plats, you have to reserve the potential impact of those new lots and new apartments as potential students. And so now you're you're adding that to the capacity of what, what, what's expected to be the capacity or the impact on, on school capacity. Do we yes, have sir. any demographics for the ex what our increase in population in Flagler County and Palm Coast has, has brought? I mean, are we looking at 50% seniors? Are we looking at 50% young families? 
Do we have any statistics on this, on what we can expect for the future? We can certainly get you that, uh, Councilman. I just, we just, I just don't have it off the top of my head. I just think, yeah, Councilman, there, there, there is a study which uh, I think staff can 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 share with you. I which think it would will be helpful for all of us. Uh, but I just think forty percent upfront is way too steep. I'd like to see it like around twenty percent. That's all I have. Can I, can, right. can I just add something real, real quick? Uh, uh, I, I want people out there to understand that what we're doing here, we're not telling the Board of Education how to spend their money, how to apply their money. We're just making sure how we're going to give them the money. That's it. And the way we're going to give you the money. You're still going to get your money. But I, I, it's, I'm under the opinion that we're not telling them how to spend their money. Right. And, and, and I, I, just, I, I also think that having a mutual agreement amongst all of us, you know, amongst us and Bunnell and Flagler County, so on and so forth, is an excellent idea. So it's, and let me, it's let me one just, uniform way of approach. Let me just add to uh, Vice Mayor Branchino's point that we won't be giving the money. The, the conversation, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the administration and the requirement to follow up and to um, uh, collect whichever method we use would fall on the school district to administer the collection of fees in whatever form they are. So it, 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 it goes away from city staff where you know it's just a, it's an administrative duty it has no 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 reason anymore so it's it would be directly between the school district and the development community is that fair enough that's right mayor we're okay. looking at been work, working with the school board to okay. make that process more streamlined yes Thank councilman you. yeah absolutely okay. uh, so in addition to that it is extremely difficult for city staff because of the nature of the uh, prop share uh, contracts being having the capability of being unique to the individual developments as well right so it, there's a, a back and forth that the city staff will be alleviated from um, which I'm a fan of and having a unified ILA makes it even easier a unified set of rules that we all follow um, <clears throat> I think there's a discrepancy in the way that we're actually calculating uh, capacity in the in the school systems I think that's what uh, part of the argument is and I think if we're talking about the study that uh, was referenced earlier there's only been uh, a f single cent single percentage or single digit percentage growth in the school systems uh, you know over these last few years from a, a state level uh, examination um, but I would say could, do you mind detailing exactly how the prop share is only when there's a deficiency in capacity within a grade cohort because that creates a lot of uh, timing discrepancies with developers and that's the part to me that uh, really proves that having a, reserva a reservation fee is much more of a, uh, I don't want to say fair, but it's just a much more standardized process uh, depending on your timing if the prop share is a requirement because of capacity issues. So could you just describe that process? Yeah, the timing, and I'm going to ask Mr. Popper to fill in if need be, um, but the timing is, you know, if you if you have a, uh, a development, a rezoning, it's not for a rezoning, it's not for we're going to take a subdivision, a three application process, subdivision master plan, preliminary plat, that's when you can start your construction. Then the final plat becomes a city council, then you have a lot record, then you can sell, right? Well, those conversations, probably at the uh, preliminary plat stage, those conversations are starting to happen with Flagler schools. Let's say there, there's not, you know, capacity in, in certain schools, then, then the applicant during that stage will um, work out an agreement with Flagler Schools, a prop share agreement. Um, up until I think this time, they have been working on each individual, and they have been um, not really set on, you know, this is how you do it, but it's a negotiated agreement, which I understand uh, with the development community. So each individual prop share agreement may be a little bit different from one development to the other one. Okay, and then that typically. Will, will take effect at the time of final plat, you know, at the, at the last stage. So they, they will have that agreement at, at final plat. Understood. And I think that highlights the discrepancies that could exist between all these different uh, agreements with the developers if we stick with the uh, prop share component of this. Um, 
yeah, that's that's my input. I, I would also uh, potentially like to ask where you see the other uh, municipalities and their governing bodies and their reflection on the situation. If you give us a little insight on how we align or we are apart in ways, I think that would also help uh, give our council a little bit of uh, more proof on the consensus that yeah. we should Councilman, be Councilman, if I could make a suggestion, <clears throat> I think your question is, is very appropriate. Um, Councillor Moylan, would you like to um, address uh, Councilman Klufus's question about the, the direction of the working group? And you'll have to present yourself. Your, your position in the working group is? Thank you, Mayor Alfin and, and Council Members. Sean Moylan, Deputy County Attorney, and spearheading the effort of the staff level working group to rewrite this interlocal agreement. Um, if I could take a moment to touch on, on several of the issues that have been discussed. Um, council members, you were correct to hone in on the total amount of the money or revenue to the schools here being the same, regardless of the, the way we uh, opt on this concurrency program. The question is a matter of timing, timing for uh, the development side and then timing for the school district side. Uh, previous to this uh, rewriting effort, the, the school district was negotiating uh, the agreements differently with each developer, and it turns out that consistency and uniformity, predictability, was one of our main goals here. And so uh, at the working group level, one option I threw on the table for discussion was to get a larger amount of revenue up front upon flat approval, but to space the remaining school district didn't seem interested in that one. They're concerned about uh, their bonding capacity and they're insisting that they need to get the revenue as soon as possible. So that's when we turn to this other proposal of rever uh, reserving capacity. I chose a number of 20%. Um, uh, you know, if, if there was another number, I asked the school staff, is there another number that makes sense for you? I was proposing 20%. And then the question is how long would that reservation be in place for? I started out with a pretty large number of 10 years because that's how long we can hold these uh, impact fees before we have to spend them on a project. The school staff suggested three years would be more appropriate if we end up going down this route. Um, and I, if I could just say, um, as your staff had indicated, uh, there's a lot of cooperation at the working group level we're coming to you with this sticking point because this is where we have to turn to the policy makers for direction. But we do have a lot of cooperation. Uh, most of the interlocal is agreed to. Uh, I myself attended our schools here, public schools, kindergarten through 12th grade. And I taught in our schools for three years at a <coughs> time when we had difficulties keeping up with the pace of development. And so the idea of having a 20% reservation fee in place <coughs> is that the schools would be getting a more consistent stream of revenue instead of, instead of waiting until they're over capacity and at a bit of a crisis to get a larger chunk. That's the underlying premise. Can you highlight that point just to make sure that, that it's reinforced? So that 20% <coughs> number is paid regardless of the level of capacity at that plat. Yes, well, we have to tie it to some level of capacity, and I've, I've written it in the current draft as 50% capacity. If our schools drop below 50% capacity, we won't need to have any of these conversations anymore. For all intents and purposes, I believe that they will always be at 50% capacity. So it would remain in place going forward, uh, whether the schools go over their level of capacity, whether um, they, they end up with some space in their schools when, they, when new facilities come online. For, for all intents and purposes, it would remain in place at all times with a 50%. So it's a ticket into the uh, development, regardless of, of what the capacity is. Correct, correct. Okay. And, they get, and they, of course, get their uh, credits for the impact fees later on. And two more questions, if I may. One is just to reinforce the point that the, the magnitude of the number, the amount, does not change with whatever system it is. In other words, it gets capped at the total amount that's calculated. One does not offer more. Again, I think you said it's a timing issue. But while you're there, and I have Ms. Bogert on the, uh, on the line, I feel a responsibility to ask both of you, <clears throat> 
I have to be protective of the city of Palm Coast. Do you foresee any significant legal risk on either path? I just need to hear that from the legal counsel. I'm not qualified to, to comment on that. If I may go first on that. Uh, yes, so, so that's a, obviously that's an important question. Reservation fees are provided for in our current interlocal. Uh, reservation fees are something that are done by Orange County. Uh, so it is something in place. I, I don't think it's uh, something that is going outside of the statute. We can tailor what we do to the strictures of the statute once we get direction from the Oversight Committee, the elected officials. Uh, and just to uh, finish up the thought on that, it's be the reason it is uh, permissible, it's an exaction for development that is tied to their level of service. You, you get to set the level of service in your comprehensive plan, acting in a legislative capacity. It's a, it's a matter of policy making, and that's very hard to attack in court because uh, as long as you're acting on a rational basis, your actions will be upheld. And I think, in my, in my opinion, this is rational because we need to prepare for future school facilities. We don't want to be in a position like we were in the early 2000s. And, and therefore, getting this more consistent stream of revenue is going to help the school system uh, with their long-term planning. And then I'll defer to uh, Ms. Ms. Reichman or Nisa, whoever it is that's uh, listening in. May, may I pose one more question uh, briefly? Yes. Um, isn't it, so can you speak to the liability of having these funds not actually being paid to the school district while capacity is not being met? What are the legal requirements for these funds to be available for, for the existing agreement when capacity, uh, th the threshold is exceeded? Is there liability in the school systems for not collecting this money more quickly? It just seems intuitive to me that you would want to collect this money more you know, quickly, as, as fast as you could, because if we don't ever cross that capacity threshold, what, what kind of legal guarantees do they have that this money will be available at that time? If, if I understand your question correctly, uh, the, the school district is allowed to exact these payments out of the developer, in my opinion, under either proposal. And so if they were able to get more up front, they, they would like that because you know they have a larger pot of money to work with. Uh, and, and that's perfectly legal under our current statutes, Chapter 163, as long as the uh, payer or is getting a credit that later on can be used when it's time to pay those impact fees. Understood. Okay, okay. that makes sense. Nasa, if you would weigh in now, um, <clears throat> um, it sounds like everyone would like to come to a common agreement so that uh, the, the, the whole area represents itself to developers and builders so it's understandable and we end up with the best schools possible, um, which we all understand the importance of that. I don't have to you know, uh, mention that again. But um, the, uh, the question I have is, um, the committee for the interlocal agreement oversight must come up with a, um, um, a joint agreement. Can you weigh in on what has to happen for each of the municipalities to make this thing work? Mayor, that, that question's for me, I'm assuming. Yes, please. Okay, so um, my understanding is that the municipalities, the uh, district, and the county are all taking these proposals back to their respective uh, governing bodies, and then are gonna come back on July 8th to try to come to some consensus on to how to move forward with the ILA and what uh, proposal, or if it's one of these, or if it's a if it's an alternate proposal, which one to agree to. But in the end, um, in, in a perfect world, there'll be one ILA that everyone agrees to, and like the last one, it will be taken back to each of the respective parties that are a part of that ILA for final approval by uh, the parties that are part of the agreement. And I understand there's some uh, time sensitivity to this based on the, uh, the county's um, decision. Yes, I believe the county, um, 
I believe the county's termination, and Ray or Mr. Moylan can correct me if I'm wrong, is August 31st of this year, where the county has indicated that it will terminate the agreement as it pertains to the county. I don't believe there's any other party to the existing or current ILA that have also terminated it. All right, thank you. Mr. Tyner, any last comments? I'm trying to get you what you need, and then we'll worry about what Mr. Klufas takes to the committee. No, sir. No? I think I've... No, I don't have any more comments. All right, let me just go down the line one more time. Comment? I've already stated how I feel about this, so I don't think there's much else. I did have one other question. Developer comes in and builds 200 houses. They start out, and, you know, two years, three years down the road, the economy changes, and it's incomplete. It stops. What is an agreement like? How does an agreement like this come into play? Well, if it totally stops the way it is now with the 40, 30, 30, the second year they would pay 30, then the third year they would pay 30 to get the 100% of the impact. Right, but they haven't finished construction. They haven't sold. They only sold half their houses. Now it's changed. They're still going to be stuck for the whole 100%. If that's what the agreement is, it would. Yeah, and that's why I kind of like a more longer five-year period with 20, 20, 20, 20, you know, something along those lines, I think. That's all. Okay, and I guess the last comment I'll make is that there is a reference that I'm aware of that if we are unable to agree on an ILA, development could be interrupted throughout the county. Can you comment on that? I think maybe NASA can comment on that. My understanding is that. NASA, would you weigh in? I don't want to put Mr. Tyner on the spot. Do you understand my question? Yes, Mayor, I understand it. There would need to be a number of things that would have to occur for a complete halt to development to happen across the county. It wouldn't be something that happens immediately with the termination of the ILA on the county's behalf. Okay. Gentlemen, are you – any last comments? I'm just going to ask you, you know, just very succinctly to give Mr. Klufus your direction to share with the ILA committee on this coming Thursday. And, Mr. Dagle, we'll get you that information in advance. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm tending to agree with Councilman Dagle on this one. It provided a little – well, space a little more for many other reasons, but they just give you one. You know, it's – I'd rather see it on a capacity reservation, 20 percent up front and then 20, 20, 20. Yeah, that's where I'm at. But I think the difference that we're talking about here, would that be more of a prop share situation? Because the 20 percent option that we're talking about with the reservation fee, the remainder of it's only collected once the building permits are issued, right? Or, I'm sorry, the remainder is collected during the building permit being issued process. The first 20 percent is paid, then the remainder is upon building permits. That's correct. And if that were to happen not within this few-year period, would they still be required to pay? If we're doing 20, 20, 20, 20, if there's an economic downturn and something were to occur, would we still want them on the hook? Well, they wouldn't be on the hook because they wouldn't have the building permits. They would have ceased. But to me, what if it takes, you know, a little longer to finish this thing out? Yep. I don't think you should pay for something until, you know, you're at the point where you have to pay for it. Yeah, I'm with you on that. You see what I mean? Totally. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. I am going to ask, we do have representatives here from the school district. If you have a comment, not on the philosophical, is there anything that we have missed in our discussion today 
without going back through the whole history of this that would be important for our messenger to bring forward at the uh, ILA committee on Thursday. Ms. Bott, you represent the school district. Just let everybody know who, who you are. And I, I'd like you to keep it just to any, anything that we may have overlooked. Yes, sir. I'm Patty Bott. I'm the coordinator of planning and intergovernmental relations for the school board. Just a few things. Um, currently, what we do is negotiate those agreements with each developer, not the amount, but the timing based upon their build out. They had asked for something that gave them a better time frame so that they would see what was the future had. And that's why we had proposed the 40 30 30 because it's something they had asked for. The other thing, the reason the three years is because when I get an application for a new development, I have to look ahead three years and say whether I'm going to have capacity. If I don't know that I'm going to have the funds to build the school, we're going to have portable after portable after portable until I have enough funds that we can go out and bond. Currently, the total amount for these schools is like $175 million. Over three years, based upon the developments that are in the pipeline right now, if we had proportionate share, we would collect $53 million over those three years. If we have the 20% capacity reservation, we would collect $13 million. $13 million is not enough for us to guarantee our bonding. One of the other important aspects I wanted to bring up, sorry, is the statute 163-3202, which does include um, educational facilities as a public facility. And I know your attorney can consult you on this, but our attorney has consulted us and said a local government may not issue a development order permit that results in a reduction in level of service, be it that water, sewer, transportation, parks. When you have a new development come in, you make sure you have the roads, you make sure you have water and sewer before they can start building. The school board needs the same thing. We need to be able to plan to build. We need to be able to do site prep. We need to find land, buy land, and move forward with it. We can't just wait until the money comes in later. It is the same money. They do get 100% um, back in the impact fees. But statute requires that the landowner or the developer pay for their proportionate fair share. The last thing I wanted to bring up real quickly. Sorry, I'm out of order. It's how the funds can be utilized. Impact fees can be utilized for constructing, acquiring, or improving capital facilities. They can be used to pay the debt. They can be used for school buses. Proportionate fair share is outlined and required strictly to pay for that capacity with which you collect it for. So right now we're over capacity middle school and high school. When they pay proportionate fair share, that money goes directly split up exactly what was paid for middle school and what's paid for high school. And those are in separate accounts. It has to be used for that. Concurrency reservation fees that we have seen are have only been used in counties that also have proportionate fair share. Our current ILA says each of the communities will collect 100% of the impact fees up front from a developer, and we haven't asked that to be done, but that's what the current ILA says, and we will have proportionate fair share. So the fact that there's capacity reservation, there's nothing in statute that says how the school district has to use it. Proportionate fair share is the only thing that really protects you, the developers, and the community. Okay. Thank you very much for the comments, and uh, we'll see you at the... Uh, meeting on Thursday so yeah mayor I'm sorry, I, I sorry uh, mayor. my mistake Friday July 8th yes okay a whole extra day good gentlemen um, what I'm going to what I'm hearing and I'll need you to correct me or fine-tune what I say is that there seems to be a consensus on the um, the process of um, Reservation. There is a ongoing discussion on the phasing of the percentages. Um, I certainly will ask the question: Are those percentages chosen arbitrarily, or are they? Do they have some backup or some meaning, which is something that we could uh, discuss on Thursday? 
Does anybody want to add something to that? Because that's what will be carried forward to the group on Thursday. Councilman Danko, anything that, that we've missed? I think, I think we, we all kind of are on the same page here from what okay. I'm gathering. Vice Mayor? Okay, 2020, 2020. And uh, Councilman Klufus? Yep, I'm hearing that loud and clear. Okay. Uh, Mr. Tyner um, and Mr. Papa, um, do you require any additional direction at this time, or are you good with, uh, with this conversation? Yeah, I think we're good with the conversation. You, Very good. Yep. Okay, with that, then we'll, uh, we'll move forward. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. John? You can join us again, John. <laughs> <laughs> you can wake up. Uh, no, it's hard not to speak up. Ms. Bogert, that's, that concludes our discussion regarding the agenda item um, for the school planning interlocal agreement. Yes, so we're on to agenda item number six. Correct. So before we begin um, today, with the council business portion of the meeting, <clears throat> I want to take a moment to discuss City Council processes relating to approval or denial of items presented to, to Council at all business meetings. For each workshop, City Council receives a comprehensive overview of each item. And at that time, it is Council's opportunity to provide opinions and ask questions on each item. Just a reminder, items that are quasi-judicial in nature will require council to base their decisions on only what is presented at the scheduled public hearings conducted at the scheduled business meetings. The purpose of a business meeting is for council to review and weigh all the evidence and take action with decisions based on all information presented both at the prior workshop and today. With that, we'll go to uh, agenda item G, ordinances second read, and will city council please read the item number six into the record. Yes, this is the town center track 16 and 17 comprehensive plan amendment, an ordinance of the city council of the city of Palm Coast, Florida, providing for the amendment of the city of Palm Coast 2035 comprehensive, land, comprehensive plan as previously amended pursuant to section 163 Florida statutes, amending the future land use map designation for 29.42 acres of certain real property from conservation to DRI urban core, providing for conflicts, ratification of prior acts, codification, severability, and an effective date. City council members, this item is a legislative item since it's a comprehensive plan amendment. So no disclosure of ex parte communications is necessary. Mr. Tyner. Thank you, thank you. Y'all, um, this, this was heard at the June uh, 21st uh, business meeting. This is a second read, as you may recall. This was a conservation area that was conducted by an inter aerial interpretation and actual ground truthing that determined what the line is. Uh, we don't have any additional information. We are here for questions. Um, Mayor, we're ready to take action. City Council, uh, Mr. Klufus, you have a question nope, to catch no. up on that? No. Anybody? Very straightforward. Um, if there are no questions, I will open the item up to the public. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak to this item at this time? Uh, I just missed uh, which item were you uh, requesting public comment on. So the item that we are discussing is the, uh, uh, Mr. Tyner, could you um, give the title for your president, for your, for your comment? It was an ordinance amending the town center at Palm Coast, um, so, sorry, Mayor. Um, it's a, it's a uh, ordinance for town center track 16 and 70, future land use map amendment application. This is the correction 50. of a map that was done years ago from a high altitude, and now we have boots on the ground that have um, defined the actual limits of the property precisely. Okay, no, that, I thought that was, uh, you were allowing for the school interlocal agreement for the impact fee. No, we, we, clo we closed that item, so. But you didn't give uh, public comment. No, it's it's a presentation. 
Um, are there any other members of the public that would like to comment on this agenda item? Seeing no one approach, I'll close public comment. Any last uh, questions uh, or comment discussion? So I will uh, ask for a roll call vote, please. Need a motion. I'll, I'll motion to uh, approve the ordinance as read. I'll second it. So we have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? So then I will ask for the vote. Vice Mayor Brinkfino? No. Council Member Danko? Yes. Council Member Finelli? Yes. Council Member Klufus? Yes. Mayor Alpin? Yes. Motion passes four to one. So we move forward to item number seven, and uh, will City Council please read number seven into the record for us? Yes, this is the first amended and restated Town Center at Palm Coast Master Plan Development Agreement, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Coast, Sparta, approving the third amended and restated development agreement for the Town Center at Palm Coast Master Plan Development clarifying that Town Center Architectural Review Board review and approve design of projects, amending designation of tracts 16 and 17 from town business to town residential, clarifying tracts and town business areas permit institutional uses, permitting certain commercial service uses in town core area, including hospitals, and defining and permitting student housing, reducing minimum lot sizes in town core and town residential areas, establishing minimum living areas for residential uses, clarifying rules for construction fences, amending parking requirements for multifamily development on certain parcels, regulating overnight parking, and updating and combining certain exhibits to reflect text changes to the MPD, providing for legislative findings and intent, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. City Council members, this is a quasi-judicial matter, so if there's been any ex parte communications as it pertains to this item, please disclose them on the record now. None. Councilman? Councilman? None. I have none. Councilman? Vice Mayor? I've had none. There are none. Good evening, Mayor. Thank uh, you. Again, this uh, was heard at the uh, June 21st uh, business meeting, along with the development of regional impact modification. That was adopted at, at your uh, June 21st business meeting. This is a second read uh, for the master plan development, and I think our city attorney did an excellent job at summarizing some of the changes that are in there. There are no additions to this item. We are ready to take action, uh, and we're here for, for any questions you may have. Any questions from City Council at this time? Is, is this the lot that we're going to have uh, the multifamily homes with 25 feet wide lots and uh, apartments of 400, feet, 400 square feet apartments? Yeah. Yes, sir. That's the one, isn't it? Yes. Okay. I just, all I have to say is this, that uh, <clears throat> once again, having homes built on lots like this, uh, 400 square feet homes what we're doing over here we are disguising workforce housing and work when it's not workforce housing I insist on this what we doing okay we're discussing excuse me for workforce housing for affordable housing but the problem here and we've seen it we see what's going on is when we build affordable housing that people can't afford, that's a recipe for what? That's where I leave my question, Mark. Thank you. Any other comments from uh, City Council at this time? The, the, only, the only comment, Vice Mayor, I would make is that you referred to 25-foot lots. If it's my understanding that these are attached uh, uh, construction, so the 25 feet refers to the actual uh, frontage of the of the of the building itself. It's not a. I don't want to. I don't want the public to be confused about a a piece of land that is of that configuration. These are townhouse attached constructions. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Bring that slide and and up. and also too, I want to reiterate too. It's also a minimum. You know, yes. As well. Can you see the slide? Yes. Uh, Any way you could bring that. Uh, so it shows how the, the home is going to be. And if I could, I would also just note the additional demographic that we're going to have in town center with our Mendex uh, projects and these additional 
uh, nursing schools, the UNF, I think that there's a demographic that can't certainly a afford a, uh, to rent a, a full home without uh, roommates, and I think that this potentially could serve uh, a growing need for individuals who are attending our local universities here. V so Vice Mayor, I'm sorry. I, I think this is the graphic that you're asking for. Yes. I, I just want to be clear that this graphic uh, is a representation of a potential commercial development in town center. This is uh, what they're calling the live, work, learn area. And this does provide for the narrower lots with the intention that those narrower lots would be bought by individual business owners for development with a, um, as you can see in the graphic, with a combined shared parking in the back. But yes, each of these squares would be available to a small business owner to potentially put whatever, maybe a music school and have the capacity to build uh, an apartment or living area on the second floor. Typical of uh, the older, um, the more traditional downtown neighborhood that we've seen in some of the more historic cities. But yes, the, 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 but this amendment does, the entirety of the amendment does provide for the, uh, the, the smaller lot sizes and provides for those minimums. So what you're saying is an accountant could uh, run a business downstairs and live upstairs yes, sir. and extend his hours. Right. But uh, I just just, just as one of many, many, many examples. Okay. Right. I just good. wanted to be clear that, that this was... I appreciate that. You're, but you're not wrong that the amendment itself does include some of this. I read it, so... Yes, sir. Okay. All right, very good. All right, with that, I will open up the item for public comment. Are there any members of the public that would like to comment on this item at this time? Please approach the podium. Seeing no one approach, I will close public comment. Any additional discussion uh, by City Council at this time? I would ask for I'll a motion. Make the motion. I have a motion. I'm asking for a second. I'll second it. I have a second. Uh, any additional discussion? I will ask for a roll call vote, please, with the clerk. Vice Mayor Branquino? No. Councilmember Danko? Yes. Councilmember Finelli? Yes. Councilmember Kufus? Yes. Mayor Alfred? Yes. Motion passes four to one. All right, we move on to the next item, um, which will be item number eight. If uh, City Council would please read into the record for us. Yes, this is a rezoning application for number 5059, the Old Kings Road multifamily rezoning, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Coast, Florida, providing for the amendment of the official zoning map as established in section 2.06 of the City of Palm Coast Unified Land Development Code, amending the official zoning map for 12.07 acres of certain real property described as portions of tax parcel identification numbers 49-11-31-0000-01010-0050, generally located about one mile south of Utility Drive and two miles north of the intersection of Town Center Boulevard and Old Kings Road, from the General Office Zoning District to the Multifamily Residential Zoning District, providing for conflict, providing for severability, and providing for an effective date. City Council members, this is a rezoning application, so it is quasi-judicial. If you've received any ex parte communications as it pertains to this matter, please disclose them on the record now and whether or not it will influence your decision today. Councilman? Councilman? No. I have received um, emails from the public that will not affect my decision making on this item. Vice Mayor? I also had an email, but I think it was more a sarcastic email from our good friend, so still, that is absolutely not going to influence my uh, decision. Either. Councilman Klufus? I've had no communications that would influence my decision tonight. Clerk has the record. I do, thank you. Very good. If you would begin your presentation, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, this was a, a, a second reading. Um, the first reading was held on uh, June 21st at your last uh, business meeting. Uh, we have no additional information. Um, the staff report was not changed with our criteria. Uh, Ms. Myers does have a presentation ready if you would like to hear it, but if not, we're ready to take action, and um, the applicant is also here if you have questions. So I will uh, ask uh, City Council, um, does anyone need to, to re-see the, uh, the uh, presentation? Uh, Good. No, it's just for the people out there. Are we rezoning from what? To what? 
We are rezoning uh, Office 2 to multifamily residential 2. So from business to multifamily? To office to, to residential, yes. Just the people to know. Yeah. Okay. All right, with that, if there are no other questions um, of staff, I will uh, open up for public comment. Are there any members of the public that would like to comment on this agenda item at this time? Yes, ma'am. My name is Celia Buglisi. Um, uh, I I live in, no I take all Kings Road to be, to come here today. We are adding more housing, multifamily to all Kings Road. It's a narrow road. It's dangerous. When is the city council, the county, the FDOT, and the state of Florida going to decide to widen both all Kings Road, like? should be widened from is being widened uh, nearby uh, town center, but it needs to be widened for all this new housing, all the way to Pampos Parkway, and north of Pampos Parkway. It's 15 years overdue, the widening of Old Kings Road from Pampos Parkway to now the Matanzas access, okay? Uh, and uh, it is all this housing to be approved, and I understand <laughs> Uh, here, uh, Consumer Branquino, we do not have the road infrastructure to be able to hold all that traffic uh, when it comes about the safety of the residents with all this growth. And so that's the only thing I can say. When are we going to get the funds and everything we need to widen all Kings Road? There is a big access that will take all this incredible dangerous traffic from our little lanes and drives and etc. That's the only thing. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, please. Robert McDonald, Palm Coast. Exactly where on Old Kings Road is this multifamily housing going to be. But my biggest concern is how far are they going to set back from the street and how far back are they going to go? And my concern is um, the reason I'm concerned about how far they're going to go back into the woods or up into 95. My concern is if we get a, God forbid we get a a major fire, are we going to have enough hose to reach the back of the building? That's my only biggest concern. So okay. I need to know how far back off of Old King Road is this property going to set. Very good. See, manager has a, a note on that. Very good. Thank you for your question. Any other members of the public like to speak on this item at this time? Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, Palm Coast does not need more demand uh, on our Please already... just introduce yourself for I'm the sorry. record. Thank you. You know me. Darlene Shelley. I live in Hidden Lakes off of Old Kings Road. Um, we do not need more demand on our already strained infrastructure, roads, and schools. We do not need more urban sprawl. The decisions you make here have lasting implications on the future of Palm Coast. If you continue to approve every special exception and zone change that a developer sends your way, you are not protecting the beauty and character of Palm Coast. Bigger is not better when it comes to multifamily apartment complexes. The original planners and forefathers of Palm Coast had a vision for smart growth with the needs of the citizens in mind. We are asking you to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the local residents of Palm Coast under Land and Development Code 2.0505, which states in D, the proposed development must not create an unreasonable hazard or nuisance or constitute a threat to the health, welfare, and safety of the city's inhabitants. And in A, it states, the proposed development must not be in conflict with or contrary to the public interest. The project is contrary to the public interest. It will negatively affect our safety and home values will raise the crime rates in local area 
and is unnecessary, incompatible, and inconsistent with the surrounding communities. There is no infrastructure in place to handle this unnecessary growth, and there are already plenty of MFR multifamily options in town center, and more coming on parcels already zoned for this type of use. Old Kings Road cannot handle it, the schools cannot handle it, and the infrastructure cannot handle it. Not to mention the ridiculous land swap option proposed, proposing a hairpin turn for an exit ramp. This is not safe, smart, or in the best interest of anyone in Palm Coast, except the landowner, developer, and realtor. Crime rates in Toscana and Hidden Lakes are currently negligible, low on the crime statistics map. Crime in time, Town Center is the highest in Palm Coast. Do not put our safety, health, and welfare and our property values in jeopardy. Please protect the beauty, safety, and future for Palm Coast. Deny this application for zone change and any future project requested solely for the profits of the developer and not in the best interests of the concerned citizens of Palm Coast. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any other speakers uh, would like to address City Council at this time on this agenda item? Seeing no one approach, I will close public comment, uh, come back to City Council. Any further discussion? Ms. Shelley, I completely agree with you, and, uh, and I want to make sure that I'm clear about this. I have absolute no problem, and let, this, let me put it up there, with diversity. I love diversity. What I don't like is density. That's what's creating that. And I said that to too many people. We will have affordable housing when nobody else wants to live over here. I invested all my life savings in Palm Coast. The people who are investing here are investing for their profits. I invested in my home. I live in affordable housing. It's because I could afford it. So what we're doing, we're disguising workforce housing over here with affordable housing. And I'll repeat this as many times as I have to. When you build affordable housing that people can't afford, it's recipe for, and I'll leave a question mark. Councilman Clifford, any last comments? Uh, no, but I would just uh, touch base on the Old King's widening project and how it had to be split apart because uh, FDOT would never approve a huge, you know, three-digit million-dollar project, and that's why over the years they've been cascaded because that's the only way for us to actually get to the top of the list for funding. Councilman? Nothing. Councilman? Nothing. All right, with that, then I would ask for a motion. I will uh, move uh, to approve ordinance uh, amending section 2-1 City of Palm Coast Corp, or I'm sorry, uh, 2022 uh, Old Kings Road Multifamily Rezoning Application number 5059. Is there a second? I'll second it. So I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Brank Camino. Council Member Danko? Yes. Council Member Finelli? Yes. Council Member Clufus? Yes. Mayor Alton? Yes. Motion passes four to one. We now move to item number nine. If uh, council would uh, please read that into the record. Of course, Mayor. This is an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Palm Coast, Florida, amending section 2-1B, City of Palm Coast, corporate seal, logo, use of, code of ordinance of the City of Palm Coast, providing for severability, providing for codification, providing for conflict, and providing for an effective date. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kershaw, you have a, uh, a brief comment or presentation? I do not have a presentation. Um, this is second read. So this is just a little bit of housekeeping for this ordinance um, to update it to our new marketing logo. Um, it does not affect the city's seal at all. It's just our marketing logo that you've seen. So clean up of the records uh, for the future. Exactly. Any questions by city council on this item? No questions. Very good. Um, I'll just put it out to the public. Are there any uh, members of the public that would like to comment on the item at this time? Please come forward. McDonald Palm Coast. Can somebody please explain to me what they plan to change? Because I'm an old Irish Catholic from New Jersey who we learned a long time ago, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. We've had that 
logo and our seal and everything else for 23 years. Now all of a sudden, somebody comes up with a bright idea. Oh, we gotta change this. No, you don't have to change this. <laughs> the only thing you gotta change is, never mind, I can't say that. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> you, can't, you can't keep spending our money like this. This is, a, how much is this project gonna cost? Because nobody has come out yet and said, okay, if we do this, this, and this, and change this, this, and this, it's gonna cost X amount of dollars. I don't know how many people stood up here a couple of months ago and adamantly said that you folks don't deserve the raise that you got. But you didn't listen to us. You voted it all on yourself. Now, same thing with the Green Lion Inn. People came up and protested, did everything in the world. So hold that, hold that comment for the agenda item, but go ahead. Okay. But you're not telling us how, how, why, whose bright idea was this, and how much this bright idea <laughs> is going to cost the taxpayers. Because our taxes are going up every year. Sewage just went up. You're going to vote on a few minutes about who's going to pick up our garbage. You know, so you got to let you guys got to let us know. I mean, we're not mind readers, but we need to know as residents whose bright idea this was, and how much is this project going to cost. But why? Like I said, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. All right. Thank you for your comment. City Manager, do you want to weigh in or have staff just comment on the fact that this logo has been in place for some time? This is just a, a bookkeeping or a, a clerical update? Yes, that's correct, Mayor. This is a brand logo that we've been using for quite some time. It does not affect our city seal, as Ms. Kershaw already explained. And at this point, with just aligning what has already been placed for many years, this is why we call it a house cleaning item. This does not have a cost. If it did, it would be part of your packet. Very and and it's just, a, it's well. just a, a line of verbiage that used to require the marketing logo to match the seal. Really, at the end of the day, that's really all it is, right? Just in our city's standards, we required it to match, and now we have a different world. We live in a different world than 2004. Very good. All right, thank you. Um, any questions? Okay, so we, I'll close. Uh, are there any other members? Are there, are there any other members of the public that would like to comment at this time? Yes, I just want to second here um, the resident, Mr. McDonald. Uh, as, a, as an owner of a printing, uh, I know how expensive it is to change all logos. The, I want to have reassurance. When we see our city, uh, vehicles, we are used to see this logo. It's been quite changed. They changed it already. Now they're going to change it again. It is very expensive in the fleet, just in the fleet of the city vehicles when they change the logo. And this is all paid by us. They have to go and get a new logo. It's expensive in each vehicle, just in that, in all your, your uh, envelopes, in, in everything, print out. Um, and lately I asked this I asked in the city website, I heard that they were gonna do a new website, and I said, who's paying for that? Are we gonna, oh no, no, it's gonna be, uh, I said, you're gonna pay a fortune for that? And some consultant, went, oh no, no, we're gonna be doing it in-house, but everything takes time and change. We have hard times now, and I'm asking the city again, do not waste fixing something that looks so good just because somebody thinks it's, it's an, a better art looking better, uh, you know, um, publishing. Uh, the best way to publish the city of Pampos is to hear what the residents are asking you. Because when people will hear that, and they will come here and say, they will gonna hear us what, what we are asking for. And lately, I don't know what is happening with city administration, but it comes to, to cell towers, changing the, the zoning for a cell tower on us. So in front of let's, our home. let's stick to the, the agenda city item here. Yeah, yes, okay. Yes, I understand. The city logo and other things that they are imposing on us. And I don't think administrators hear the residents outright. And the people don't come here because 
they don't have the hours to sit and wait to speak. And they are very discouraged, but there is a lot of uh, um, concern on the citizen, uh, in the citizens of Pampos, what is taking place, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Can I, can I follow up on that? Just that we are not replacing any seals, logos on any vehicles at all. This was just a line in an ordinance that used to require our, our marketing logo to match the seal. Nothing is changing. There's no dollar amount associated to this. We are just eliminating a line. So staff will follow up with each of the individuals to help them understand that uh, what, what the administrative housekeeping on this issue is before it gets out of control. Good. Any other members of the public like to uh, comment at this time on this item? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Any further discussion by City Council? I move to approve it. I have a motion to approve and a second, Mr. Finelli. Um, any further discussion? Um, roll call, please. Vice Mayor Branquino? Yes. Council Member Denko? Yes. Council Member Finelli? Yes. Council Member Kufus? Mm, okay. Yes. All right, we'll move on to um, the resolution section, and if City Council would uh, read the resolution in, and that will be followed by a presentation. Yes, thank you, Mayor. This is agenda item number 10 for residential collection services contract, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Coast, Florida, approving a service contract between the City of Palm Coast, Florida and FCC for residential solid waste collection service, authorizing the city manager or designee to execute the contract, providing for severability, providing for conflict, implementing actions, and an effective date. Mr. Mansell, if you can give your PowerPoint presentation, please. Yep, thank you. Uh, you wanna wait for the mayor to come back, I suppose? No? no I, would, I would go. All right, so uh, good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Matt Mansell, the Director of Public Works. Uh, this evening I have with me Ms. Allison Trulock, who is Managing Director uh, from New Gen Strategies and Solutions uh, in their Solid Waste Division. She is the City's consultant as we uh, have gone through this RFP process. Uh, so tonight I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Allison to begin the presentation uh, and go through the first few slides. Okay, and I'm gonna start with just giving an overview of all of our efforts to date and then an overview of the RFP release. Um, and then I wanna spend just a couple minutes talking about the challenges that are facing the solid waste industry and collection services. And then I'll hand it back over to Matt to talk about the results of the procurement process. So we did complete a lot of customer outreach back in March of 21. You may recall there was a customer survey. It was over a 30% response rate on that. There was also a town hall that was recorded so residents could go view that at their leisure. We had over 400 views of our town hall on this, so it was talking about different styles and frequency of collection. I think the main takeaway there is that residents like having twice a week garbage collection, so I would sum up all of those efforts that way. Um, that lended itself to helping us develop the RFP, so with council input and the customer survey results, the RFP was developed. It was released February 23rd, uh, and then the due date for those proposals was April 21st. Next slide. Just a few highlights of what was in that RFP. Um, one is that the initial term of the agreement was seven years. There is a CPI adjustment or a consumer price index adjustment that happens each year on the collection component of the rate, and that's looking at the garbage and trash CPI. There were five different areas of review for the evaluation criteria, so this went through things like past performance and experience, it looked at staffing, it looked at the implementation plan, it looked at the proposed resources, and then also looked at price, and each of those five different elements had 20 points apiece for a total of 100 points in scoring. As far as the collection scenario, it was just one scenario with the, the same style and frequency of collection as is currently provided. So the services that are included are very similar to today. It's twice a week garbage, once a week recycling, once a week bulk, once a week yard waste. A couple of differences is that yard waste is limited to two cubic yards instead of four cubic yards. And then on bulk waste, it's got a limit of three cubic yards per week instead of an unlimited amount. Otherwise, the services are remaining the same. And uh, for clarification, those are the services under the current bridge contract as well, right? Correct. 
I just want to give just again a quick overview of some of the challenges that are generally facing the industry. Inflation is impacting every industry, um, but equipment in particular for the solid waste collection services, there are supply chain issues, price of steel, it's impacting the price of vehicles, how long it takes to get those vehicles delivered. There's also staffing issues, CDL drivers are in very high demand. Um, there's lots of other options beyond driving garbage trucks for those CDL drivers. So there's a lot of competition and a, a shortage of those. And then obviously inflation affects the price of everything. So I have a couple of graphs I wanted to share with you guys just to illustrate these points. Next slide. This gives you an idea of what's happened with the price of steel going back to 2020. So it was 20 cents per pound back in 2020, skyrocketed up to 88 cents a pound, started coming back down, then Russia invaded Ukraine, soared back up again, came back down a little bit. So it's still more than twice what it was back in 2020, uh, but it is starting to move down on steel prices. This slide is just to kind of give you a comparison on the consumer price index. So the bar charts are, are showing you what was happening with the all urban consumers CPI, which is one version of an index, and then the garbage and trash, with the trash which is another version can see historically the, the garbage and trash had greater percentage changes or increases over the all urban. That's no longer the case. So garbage and trash is a CPI that brings in specific, a lot of different indices that um, are kind of weighted differently for the garbage and trash industry versus the all urban consumers. So that's some of the differences there, but you can see this latest comparison that the all urban consumers was nearly twice as much as the garbage and trash index. And I want to mention this because, again, you do have a CPI adjustment in this contract, but it is capped at 4%. So I want to make that point as well. Can I just ask you a question? This consumer price index is strictly for this uh, industry. The garbage and trash one, correct. It okay. is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then last of my graphs here, this is just showing you what's happened with fuel prices. So that light green line is CNG. You can see that it is usually less expensive than diesel and gasoline. Those are the other two. Um, CNG has been very constant for a very long time, and now even CNG is starting to uptick a bit on the price of CNG fuel. And I think I will turn it back over to Matt now if there aren't any more questions generally on issues impacting the industry. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so through our RFP process, we uh, held a pre-bid meeting in which we had uh, eight potential haulers in attendance. Uh, of those eight potential haulers, we had three proposals that were received by the cutoff date. Uh, at that point, we had a selection committee of five personnel uh, from city staff that convened and scored those three proposals. They uh, ranked the top two proposals and invited those companies to uh, present in person to the selection committee, and that was FCC, Environmental, and Waste Pro. Uh, the selection committee from those oral presentations uh, then ranked FCC as the top rated proposer and the intent to award was issued to FCC on May 31st, 2022. That started a three day clock in which uh, any of the proposers could protest and no protests were received by the cutoff date. So in, a, in accordance with our procurement policies and procedures, uh, at that point, we uh, commenced negotiations with FCC to finalize the price and the service agreement. So the results of the selection committee, uh, the items that they, they uh, scored was an emphasis on experience and qualifications, staffing, uh, proposed resources, implementation plan, and price. Uh, those were uh, five uh, graded areas weighted equally, and that resulted in selecting FCC again as the top rated proposer. Some of the pronounced proposal points that the evaluation team uh, identified in FCC's proposal was that more routes were proposed, which resulted in fewer number of residences per route, uh, that they offered more access to shared technology and software to city staff uh, uh, to verify um, quality of service and delivery. So that they offer a service delivery verification system uh, that gives us access to uh, password protected third eye portal for viewing video from routes, uh, which can help us identify um, complaints from some of our citizens. 
and whether or not service was provided in accordance with the contract. Um, it also uh, has an enterprise waste information system which tracks uh, equipment maintenance, uh, has a GPS system built in and track easy uh, for logging issues, which is a common industry uh, standard as well. Um, and then they had a very detailed and comprehensive implementation plan. One of the uh, factors that the evaluation team really honed in on was if we were going to transition to someone else, how detailed uh, and successful was their track record in transitioning those services uh, to minimize disruption to our citizens. All right, so uh, pricing came in. At GFL was the highest price at 38. Uh, Waste Pro was at 32.33, and although FCC was at 34.64 with their initial proposal, their final negotiated price is 32.12. And then final pricing will add a 20 cent administration fee uh, on top of that, which is to cover staff time and materials to manage the contract and mailers for our residents. So what we're asking tonight is that council uh, approve the resolution so that we can move forward with the implementation plan uh, with a projected contract start date of June 1st, 2023. And with that, we do have uh, FCC representatives in attendance tonight as well that are available uh, for any of your questions as well as staff uh, is here for any questions that you may have. So let me just say, <clears throat> I appreciate the, uh, the residents' patience tonight. Um, we've moved through the agenda as quickly as we could, but uh, appreciate your, your you know, coming here to, uh, to participate. And um, uh, sorry it's taken so long, but appreciate your patience. Are there um, initial questions from city council at this time? Uh, if you could go back to the slide showing us the initial um, amounts that uh, uh, that they offered in that um, the, the one before that uh, wasn't there an, an amount that showed that Waste Pro actually had a lower cost? So I, I have in my notes what the uh, final or the original cost from FCC was. It was thirty four sixty four. So Waste Pro was the lowest initial offer received. And, and then you negotiated it down further, correct? Correct. But, but I'm just curious, there, there was a pretty big difference between the initial offerings. Why, why did you not go with Waste Pro? So th the areas that I discussed earlier um, were graded by the evaluation team. Yeah, so there were five total areas mm -hmm. in which price was equally weighted. So there were 20 points for each category. Uh, so price was not weighted above the other areas. Okay. So when the, when the scores were gathered from the evaluation team, they were aggregated and the top score overall is the one that was the top rated proposal. So it was not based solely on price. All right. Councilman. Uh, I know that you had um, addressed more routes as being one of the um, reasons for switching to FCC. Could you elaborate on why more routes proved beneficial to our community? So I, I can. Um, more routes uh, for our community means that the collection time uh, can be completed earlier in the day, and perhaps FCC could come forward and discuss uh, some of those um, as well, some of the benefits. So the, uh, the numbers that were provided, um, Waste Pros, I believe, were just a little over 1,100 homes per route and FCC had uh, in, around 800 and some change homes per rep. So I, I think the councilman is asking, if I may, what the advantage to an increased number of routes are. Can you address that for him? Yeah, good evening. Uh, Dan Brazel, <coughs> Vice President of Operations for FCC. Uh, great question. So when we model these projects, what we want to focus on is customer service, uh, bar none, to make sure that we have the appropriate resources in our industry. Uh, we consider success comes from the resources, which is the equipment you're using, which would be the routes per day that are uh, servicing the customer and the people that are tied to those routes. So our focus is always being on the, on the top end to make sure that uh, the workload per day per truck is adequate and safe for our people to operate in a safe and efficient manner. The other benefit of that is uh, we're all in trying times right now. Labor is challenging. 
Um, and if there is a sick call, for just as an example, we have buffer built into our network where if one truck is not available to run like AOH is rare for us, we have enough uh, bandwidth built into the other routes to be able to cover that workflow and not push the work to the next day. So would, would it be appropriate to assume that if there are more routes that you're going to employ more people to fill those positions and those routes? That's correct. Did I answer your question? Vice Mayor. Uh, uh, one, I have a couple of questions, but one is your landfill, uh, if I may, dumping area. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Uh, so we'll be using uh, Tomoka Farms Landfill, which is in Volusia County. And do you have a contract at for how long? Uh, the city actually has a contract, if you want to touch on that. Correct. We have an interlocal agreement between Flagler County, the city of Palm Coast, and Tomoka Landfill, which uh, reduces the amount that we would pay as an out-of-county um, uh, municipality. Normally, I believe it's 200% for out of county. Was that correct? And uh, our interlocal agreement uh, gives us 125% of the rate versus 200% of the rate. And you're confident that we're going to be able to renew our, you know, deal with them? The, the current agreement gets us through 2026, and then we would have to discuss with, uh, with Volusia County at that time a new agreement. How confident are you? Well, we, uh, we actually met with Volusia County Solid Waste Division, uh, their director and staff, uh, last Friday. Uh, it was a very good interaction. I think the relationship is positive moving forward, so I do think that we will come to an agreement after 2026 yeah. to extend uh, The other question has to do with technology, and here I, I, I may need uh, uh, you know, help from our city attorney. Uh, we're talking about the shared video technology, which means that a truck, when a truck goes to a spot, is always filming everything. People out there are afraid of uh, Big Brother. But uh, I, I, I think, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, this will not be public record unless we ask for it here as a city. Let's say there's a dispute, and then we ask for it. Uh, uh, unless that's not public record, that's not somebody could call uh, uh, FCC and says, I want that video. But I don't know if they have to release, and here's probably when I need uh, our uh, city attorney to tell me. Could you? Be so kind and let me know, please. Uh, Councilman, if I could just chime in quick on what the what the video technology is. I think there's maybe a mis okay. misperception. So what well, we use is a uh, third eye camera system, which is an MHD uh, technology, 360 degree view around the around the truck. What we offer access to the city on is one the GPS location of the truck. So at any time they can validate where our trucks are, if they're servicing a route, if they're at the landfill, they have live access to that. The other access that is given is called positive service verification. So that is the video and pictures that is available to the city. So what that does is when our truck arrives at 123 Main Street and services the cart, when that's tipped into uh, the location or the service is triggered, there's a picture taken of the back of the truck, side of the truck, and the front of the truck, as well as a GPS location and a timestamp. That is the, the ability that the city will have to see our services being completed. Also, if there's a not out situation or maybe a customer's not home or they don't put the um, the waste curbside timely will push an exception button and it'll show it that an exception was logged at that uh, residence uh, that we were not able to service it for various reasons but we put through the GPS timestamps to back that up as well. And that would be does, a, does that answer your question? Access, okay. correct? Um, I, if I may just uh, Vice Mayor, you, you bring up a good point you, you asked the question about uh, dump site so Mr. Mansell um, <clears throat> When you're negotiating on the future use of a dump site, are you also going to consider a short dump site? Because um, obviously in terms of economy and efficiency and all the things that are they're quite obvious, will that be a part of your discussion and negotiation um, when you get to that point? I realize we're in RFP now, but Yes, Mayor, I've been uh, challenged by our city, city manager to look at many efficiencies uh, moving forward and to analyze options such as, you know, uh, if we were to have a local short site here or, um, you know, whatever site we continue to use, such as Tomoka, um, 
moving forward, we would look for those efficiencies to build into our services. And not just the efficiencies. I'd like us to be, you know, in command of, of, of that decision making. I think that uh, uh, is very important. And the other question I have is just confirm my understanding that the current contractor agreement did not have any increment elevator or CPI consideration. So to some extent, we've all enjoyed a discount over the last four years? That is correct, Mayor. So the, the previous contract did not have any escalation in rate. Uh, we we uh, had a, a rate that went into effect on day one and we received that rate through the entire contract. Um, Come hell or high water, it stayed the same. Very unusual in my, in my understanding of contracts. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Sure. Uh, my comment just revolved around, uh, I had a misconception about the process of uh, negotiation with pricing, and it's just been clarified that if you look at the scoring rubric, uh, the initial uh, dollars that were submitted by each uh, company that was offering to provide service was uh, scored against that number, not the later on negotiated number. Um, it just seems very standard, and I, I trust that staff had their due diligence, and that's the standardized process. But uh, I just wanted to ensure that everyone knew that the scoring rubric included the original uh, prices that each uh, independent contractor quoted. That is correct, yes. Thanks. Okay. I, I do have one more. Um, uh, WastePro had been advertising on social media that a contract with FCC might cost the city upwards of a million dollars extra over what waste pro was was um, proposing can you speak to where they may be getting that number from so it, it would be an assumption on my part because I was not involved in those calculations obviously but if you aggregate the uh, difference in the original price proposals received not the negotiated final price that we're receiving from FCC uh, you know times each household uh, per year um, there would be a difference of around that amount. Okay. Thank you. I, I see an awful lot of folks here, and I yeah. recognize some of them. I know they work for Waste Pro. I'm just curious, how many of your employees live in Palm Coast or Flagler County, or are they mostly out of Volusia? Uh, I don't have the exact answer. I don't know if Mitch is our director of ops. How many people are, are fully local to this? Yeah, so I, th I think the key comment that I, it's a great question, right? Uh, local, local talent and local staffing is big. And, uh, you know, we've done a lot of these transitions. Our number one goal is, is the local resources that manage the contract currently. If there is displacement from a contract award that goes to another company, uh, we are always open and willing and, and looking for the talent that has served the contract and does know the services to join our team. So uh, through all, all the transitions, we just actually did a transition last week. We got 93% of the people uh, that were working at that location uh, to join our team. Some retired, other, other people chose not to, but 93% capture rate on the existing employees. That's a, that's a big goal for us. I know it's big for, for you all, and you want to continue the service with the people that know it, the people that are here. And I assure you that's a big focus for us to become local employers and locally embedded in this community. And one other question. I've read a lot of stuff on social media. I don't know if it's true or not. Are you guys a foreign-owned com company? Or you an American company? Uh, so the contract here is with FCC Environmental Services Florida, LLC. So it is a Florida uh, corporation. Uh, our U.S. headquarters are in Houston, Texas, okay. uh, which is a, a U.S. corporation. We are globally uh, roll up to a parent company out of Madrid, Spain. that operates in 37 countries with 60,000 employees. Uh, so yes, our parent company is. However, we have operated in the U.S. since 2008. Uh, all taxes and everything else associated to that are, are really a local company here in Florida. Uh, now. Since 2008. Eight. Okay, yep. thank you. Since, yeah, since Council Mendenko opened the door, this is a question I was going to say for later. Is there any way, and I don't know if this is for legal, to put some type of assurance in the contract that um, that local displaced employees would be given some type of preference? So let, let's, let's let uh, um, City Council answer that because you've been through an RFP process and there's a contract. So will City Council weigh in on um, any alterations or changes to the um, RFP process at this time? Sure, no problem. Um, as you may or may not know, when we went through the RFP process, um, 
there was a contract attached to that, and that contract laid out the terms of what the agreement ultimately would be. Um, there were changes that were done through addendums to the RFP process. That requirement for local sur sourcing of employment wasn't in, it, it isn't in the, uh, the, the contract the way it was advertised to the RFP and, and how the contract is now the ultimate uh, negotiated contract. And and the uh, the program went through the the challenge phase as as well, so it, it kind of locks that up, which was the reason for my question before when they go back to renegotiate certain uh, parts of the of the deal going forward. Are there chances for addendum and and for you know uh, alterations, whatever? Any other? I, I still think we could encourage you to hire people from uh, in case we approve it to to get people from Palm Coast, but I don't think we could tell you who to hire. Because then, the minute we tell you to hire, the minute it becomes our responsibility. Right. So okay. we have to okay. be very careful with that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and absolutely our intent, right? As I said, this is not a, uh, it's nothing but a focus for us to retain the people that are operating this contract Good. and focus on the local okay. employment. Thank you for your, uh, for your attention and questions. Anything you need to add now? No, Mayor. So with that, I would uh, open up the uh, agenda item for public comment. So, yes, ma'am. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Heather Badger Felmont. I am a 27-year resident of Palm Coast. I have been actively involved in this community for a very long time on a personal level and a professional level. I stand here today with along with a lot of the WastePro employees who will stay with WastePro. It doesn't matter who the new company is coming in, they're dedicated to us as a company, as a team. Rest assured that. WastePro has been your local team for 16 years. We are American-owned, family-oriented company based out of Longwood, Florida, and we are committed to Palm Coast. We have been committed to Palm Coast and solely Palm Coast from this location here. Just recently, I did a survey of our own employees just to help us learn what makes our employees happy. Do you know what their answer was? a work-life balance, new fleet. They are happy to live in Palm Coast, work in Palm Coast, and play in Palm Coast. They do not attend to pick up in their pickup trucks every day, drive to Daytona, get in an FCC truck, drive back to Palm Coast, service the residents of Palm Coast, get back in their personal vehicle, and drive back to Palm Coast. I can rest assure you that's not what all right, all right, all right. Waste Pro crews have been provided, I'm sorry, excuse me. We have invested more than $21.9 million in the local facility and equipment during this time in the last 16 years. Our operation is local government, um, excuse me, local management. We do not manage our contracts from supervising your routes from another county. We do that here. We get in our personal vehicles, we go around, we pay attention, we, we, we realize what's going on in the communities, and then we do it in, in our waste pro vehicles as well. Our local payroll exceeds $5 million annually. We have 75 plus dedicated employees. Waste Pro has and always will be dedicated to be local, buy local, just like the city of Palm Coast. Waste Pro will have no transition, no new drivers, nobody to have to learn your routes, your backdoor services, your unhappy customers, etc. Waste Pro has a shorter travel time to landfills, which is why we don't have to hire additional drivers. We are not coming from Volusia to Palm Coast, we're already here. That's an unnecessary. Um, avenue to go, you heard clearly that there's a shortage of drivers. Why have to have more drivers? It's unnecessary. Why would the city want to pay for more employees when you don't have to? There are, our trackies program is exactly like theirs. They're third eye. We do the same thing. We have the same video capability. We've had that capability. They're just jumping on the ship that we're already on. We're here now, already part of this community. Don't take it away from us. We can offer the exact same thing they are, and we already have the lower price. If we would have known no negotiation was on the table, we would have been negotiating. 
We were never asked. Thank, to negotiate. thank you for your comments. Uh, I did next. want to submit one thing to council. For your comments. Uh, the next speaker, please. Doing, man. My name's Eric Thomas. I'm a resident. I own my own home. I built it 22 years ago. I'm a Waste Pro driver. I've been here seven years. I left Waste Management to come to Waste Pro. Okay. It, it, the pay is outstanding. Our helpers make $18.75 an hour. Their drivers make $17. A new CDL holder with no experience, $22 an hour. They pay $17. I'm not driving to Daytona, spend my fuel, pick up your garbage, come back. Look at the price of fuel. Doesn't make sense. We spend our money local. Helpers are making $50,000 a year. They're not. Our drivers, 60. That's new, no experience. You're taking money from your mouth. They have a speedway, they have a beach. They're fine. They don't need our money. It's ridiculous. You, we, we came in lower. They had a, a higher price. You negotiated with them. Your, your problem's with Waste Pro, not us. we changing this culture. Your garbage is getting picked up. We're set for growth. We got 10 brand new trucks right now. They got to get them. We got more on the way as soon as you sign a deal. It doesn't make sense. You don't like Waste Pro. That's in the past. We've got a new manager. You got new employees, experienced veterans, rain or shine. We're out there thunderstorms for getting you garbage. They're unproven. We're tested, tried, true. We're not going anywhere. You're taking money from that man's mouth. Where's where's Mike? Ask him how much he makes from Waste Pro. Ask our vendors. Go to Napa, see how much we spend. Boulevard tires, hundreds of thousands of dollars. The money stays here, Flyer County. Give it to Daytona. What's Daytona going to give you? Some excuses when they can't get your garbage because they don't have the drivers. Thank you for your comment. I, 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 let's respect each speaker. Hello, Please, Mayor. Fred. My name is Richie Mercer. I'm a 26-year-old resident. I've got five daughters. I'm a mechanic for Waste Pro over eight years. Um, she is correct. We do have the same technology. We actually just updated to the newest version this year. Um, we've got over 10 new trucks this year. Our equipment is second to none. They're not going to touch it. We keep our equipment top tees. I mean, you can't find nothing wrong with it. Um, as far as the dump, you got a two and a half hour ride in a garbage truck. It's not like hopping in a car to go to Daytona and back in that dump. Okay? You got an hour and a half every morning, hour and a half every evening to go back. Your driver is limited to 14 hours a day drive time. Where's that leave you for your routes? You think we're having staffing issues? We ain't. They're gonna have staffing issues, brother. We're hiring out day 20 even. They ain't. Uh, most of us are local. They're not gonna get any, any of our guys. I can tell you that right now. We're all happy. Um, as far as the fees go, I mean, just look at the numbers, man. They don't don't add up. Your CNG, you're gonna drive from Daytona, three hour round trip. You got your hour and a half in the morning, hour and a half in the evening. You're gonna have to dump, guaranteed. Okay? Your CNJ ain't gonna hold up. We have trucks run out mid midday sometimes. It's gonna happen. So that's gonna cut in your routes. You know, you got all this stuff that's gonna give you downtime. You might have a ten minute road call. Guess what? They're two hours away. What are you gonna do? Now you don't need more time. It's gonna happen. Happens with all vehicles. You put 40 hours, 50 hours a week on the vehicle. So, anyway, that's all I got to say. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next speaker, please. Yes, sir. Uh. Hopefully, this will be the last time. Robert McDonald, Palm Coast. What I don't un what I don't understand is, again, I keep asking the question about the money. Nobody is telling us how much this is now going to cost us more. And I don't know, when I went to school and I learned union negotiations and contracts, 
I learned that whoever comes in with the lowest bid gets the job, irregardless of who is promoting it. Now, I have all the respect in the world for every city employee, and I know most of them. But my question is, why did we take five city employees to make the decision for 100,000 people? We don't even know if these five people even live in Palm Coast. Because we don't know who they were. I mean, they were handpicked by somebody. Why didn't you come, why didn't the city form a committee of residents who were going to pay for this new increase? And again, I keep repeating myself. If it ain't broken, don't fix it. Yeah, I've had personal issues with WastePro, but I got a phone call from WastePro apologizing because they didn't do something. I, I don't know this other company. I mean, I wish them well. But you heard them say they only have three or four employees who live in Palm Coast. Do you think you're really going to care about the residents of Palm Coast? Uh -uh. The people that care about Palm Coast are the people who every day go to work and work in the trenches to pay their bills. And now, <coughs> I don't know where the money's coming from, but the one good thing is, which is really good, maybe other than the city attorney, all of you live in Palm Coast. So that means that when your taxes, when my taxes go up, all of your taxes are gonna go up. And when you have to pay more money for garbage to be picked up, you're gonna have to pay it just like I do. So that's the only consolation to all the residents. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next speaker. Okay. Hi guys. My name is Michael Morea. I own Environmental Land Services of Flagler County. I've been doing business with the city for 19 years. I own the recycling, transfer station, C and D, and I take in um, all the FEMA work. I've helped you guys out with FEMA. Waste Pro dumps in my yard. A lot of the guys that work for me depend on Waste Pro because I, I employ 60 people at Environmental. I didn't even hear from anybody from the city to even get a proposal in to give you guys a price on dumping the trash in my yard on US 1 and County 113. Another thing, the, the story they're telling you about uh, putting more routes out there, and I'm not going after any company, I'm just telling you why they have to put more routes out there, because they have to truck the trash to Volusia County. You could not do it with the amount of trucks that Waste Pro has. It's impossible. So a while back ago, just to bring something up, Waste Pro had left me on the date of 8 19 and they came up with a brilliant idea that they were to bring their garbage to Ormond Beach and not dump it at ELS. What happened to all that? They couldn't give this service, and Ormond Beach is a lot closer to Daytona. They came back to me October 14th, I'm 21. The service has been impeccable. Everything's getting picked up. We're always gonna have problems. I've been in the waste business 35 years. I got my heart and soul in that company. I have 10 million just in my yard in equipment, recycling equipment. So you guys really, really got to look at what's going on here. Another reason why I think they want to put more trucks on the road, there's more people moving here. The routes are going to get filled in. Waste Pro would be putting more trucks on the road if they need to be. But I think right now, look, and I've been looking, and I've been in this business 35 years from a kid, but my grandfather, and my father, I think they're doing a great job, and you guys should reevaluate what's going on. One more last thing. I think the, the, the agreement with Volusia County is probably 44, 50 a ton. When you put two hours on that route, on a truck, you're talking, you're adding another $15 a ton to that price. With two men in a truck, two hours, the fuel. So you're looking at probably $60 a ton. 
You guys really need to look at this situation and evaluate. We recycle everything at ELS. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is Greg Blasse. I'm president and CEO of the Palm Coast Flagler Regional Chamber. And I'm uh, before you today to ask you to support keeping our garbage company local. Waste Pro has been a very important part of Palm Coast and the community for over 16 years. And they're longtime supporters of the chamber. Uh, I constantly see them at community events, participating in many different causes, such as food drives, educational events, fundraisers. Specifically, Waste Pro supported our own Junior Chamber of Commerce, which is comprised of uh, over 50 local high school students, on an event that those students wanted to execute, which was the Youth Substance Abuse Prevention Forum. Uh, Waste Pro helped underwrite that. Um, you heard earlier uh, this year also that um, on July 23rd, Waste Pro has signed up to support the Junior Chamber kids by uh, helping us clean the roadway and the sidewalks over here at FPC along SR100. Um, I guess what I'm getting at is whenever they are asked to participate or contribute, Waste Pro always comes through. Waste Pro's operation is local and they spend local. Their office is located right down here on 100 and they have many employees, some of which are definitely here. Uh, much has been made about the cost of providing waste services in our community. Uh, when forced into the uncomfortable situation of providing a one-year bridge contract, Waste Pro was directly challenged to make sure the price was in the best possible position when we reached this point. And today we know Waste Pro did have the best initial bid, and yet the city's internal staff group selected the more expensive FCC group to award the contract or the bid to, after which city staff negotiated with FCC to lower the bid to one penny below what Waste Pro's original bid was. So this is the city's process, and I think it's important to, to have a conversation about because this is the first time we get to talk about it together publicly. Uh, because of the city's process, Waste Pro was never engaged to propose a lower bid like FCC was, uh, because you must be first elected by city staff as the company, and then the negotiations can take place. So the resolution before you is the result of internal city staff choosing another uh, provider and then negotiating their rate down to beat Waste Pro's initial bid by a penny. So we really don't know how much lower Waste Pro could have gone on price. Um, they beat FCC once, and so the question in my mind is could they, could they do it again? But even if the costs were uh, essentially the same, uh, I would still urge you to stick with Waste Pro. Uh, I don't know why you would hire a new company that may take these jobs to another county, may operate out of another county. Why would we lose, even more important possibly, is why would we lose the economic impact funds of a company as large as Waste Pro? Uh, you know, and I spent the last eight years in Tallahassee. They got some pull, and uh, they got their act together on community stuff. So, look, uh, I'll just simply wrap up by saying Waste Pro truly believes and participates in the be local, buy local mentality, and uh, they have been uh, become a part of our Palm Coast family, and I believe we should keep it that way. Thank so you thank for you. your comment. Next speaker, please. Good evening, Mayor. Gene Dowd, Palm Coast resident. Uh, First, I'd like to say that I don't have any family or friends that work for Waste Pro. I had no tours, as others have talked about in past meetings. But what I don't understand, Mayor and Council, this is a company that started here in 2007, signed a five-year deal, honored that deal. 2012, after the financial collapse, they signed another five-year deal. In 2017, they signed another five-year deal, went through the pandemic. And yet, did I get my recyclables picked up a day or two late? Yes, I did. I don't know what company wasn't hurt or what business wasn't hurt during the pandemic. And I heard tonight in other topics that were four property owners, were four business builders, and we have a business in this community that's giving back for years. Now, I've only lived here for eight. I've never had better service. In fact, Smiley over there is always smiling when he picks up on Tuesday, and his driver is always laughing. They're a great group of people, but they do provide a service. That's their business. So my question is, and I want to be consistent, I thanked the city when they hired a consultant, and she went back and proved everything that their representative said here months ago, why the cost had to be $29. When they were pushed to reduce that, he stood his ground. And she came back and talked about materials, staffing, metals. Today we saw on that screen garbage collection in the 
Community is way up over business. What business wouldn't have tough times keeping up? But they've done that. And they are a great, and thank you, city, because I wrote them after that meeting. Because I never thanked them. But they deserve it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speak. All right, all right, all right. Next speaker, please. My name is Jason. Um, I've been a long time uh, resident here in uh, Palm Coast for a long time. Many of these people have touched on a lot of uh, notes that I already had in my paper, but um, to kind of speed things along, uh, WastePro is definitely a, uh, a vendor that will stick through it. Um, these guys don't get recognition for half of what they do. As they stated, they're out there day in, day out on the days that we don't want to be in there. It was 113 degrees two weeks ago, and these guys are out there day in and day out. Um, I personally know my, my, uh, my drivers alone. They're awesome. Cans are always put back. They go out of their way. I'm also a small business owner here in town. I work hand in hand with WastePro. WastePro dedicates, gives back to the community, as everybody says. They, um, they sponsor baseball teams here locally, youth baseball teams. They're constantly with the children. Um, some things we didn't touch on, FCC's Google rating is a 3.9. WastePro's Google rating with the people are a 4.6. So things you need to really think about. As the gentleman stated, during the pandemic, it's been tough for everybody. How many businesses could not even provide an income? Still to this day, a very good friend of mine, Mikey Mezzaluna, can't staff his businesses. Great, great companies here. This team is staffed. They're good. Their children are here. This feeds them. You have a company coming in to take over. It seems like through all the publicity, all the news, all the flag their lives, that for some reason, WastePro is not wanted. But as these gentlemen said, they're not WastePro. They're human beings that are working in this town. We need to give back to this community and stay within this community. Um, I don't know if this is true, and maybe FCC can speak to it, but I heard through the grapevine that FCC doesn't have full-time helpers. They hire temp agents as helpers. That's something to keep in mind when WastePro has full-time helpers that they pay $50,000 a year to. So you're bringing in people that this community does not even know, backgrounds, things for safety for our community, things that people really need to think about. And as I said before, um, these guys are great, and if you ever stopped on the side of the road and really had a conversation with them, you'd really realize they have the biggest heart in the world and they're all about Palm Coast and being a part of this community. They do the um, touch a truck a -thon. These guys take great pride. They love to come out and interact with this community. So as much as I, I have on this paper, I just want to say everybody needs to really take a minute and think about they're cheaper. They've been here. We're not having to start over. We're not having to go through all the same mistakes that Waste Pro got criticized over. Oh, my, my trash wasn't picked up. FCC is going to experience that as well. So why go backwards and continue to push forward is all I'm asking. So with that being said, I just hope that we stay and vote with Waste Pro to stay in the community and support them. Thank you for your comment. Uh, the next speaker, please. I'm Chad Felmitz, City Councilman and Women. Um, just try and keep it brief. Uh, just I know all these guys. I know most uh, professionally, a lot of them personally as well. I know they grind it out. They, they win it. Obviously, they were out dark to dark. Uh, they got the job done. You did your survey. You got, I, uh, from my understanding, it's like 60 plus in, uh, percentage approved of Waste Pro on, on hand. Um, they give back to the community, obviously. I've personally uh, handed boxes of food to pantries here in town. Uh, stood there with a the big check, five grand, to pantries here in town. Uh, working with my wife, she's been on the back of trucks to get the job done for this town. They're there for the Christmas parade. They give to the sheriff's gala. They do roadside cleanups apart from their daily jobs which is their job to clean up trash and pick up trash. Uh, John Jennings is a great guy. He reinvests in his company. He's going to reinvest in getting more trucks. Obviously, he gets new trucks all the time. I'm out of Jacksonville. I actually am a Waste Pro employee as well. Proud to be here. I'm out of Jacksonville, though. But I'm a city of Palm Coast resident. Uh, he invests in his guys. If he hires them, if they need a CDL, he puts them through the cohort program if they're willing to go through it grows these gentlemen, gets them going further than they probably ever planned on going, you know. Uh, the growth, City of Palm Coast is no doubt growing. Palm, uh, Voice Pro can keep with that growth. growth. Uh, I think it's pretty evident. Uh, I want to keep my points positive for Waste Pro and not bash any competitor, but I think it's pretty evident that uh, FCC would be banking on taking some employees and staffing their 
you know, their team with Waste Pro employees to get the job done. You're going to have problems. This, we are going through turbul turbulent times enough right now. I think you need to rethink this. Stick with the, you know, with the team you got at home already. Um, we've established history with uh, with a lot of you guys, as far as my wife, and the, you know, you have her number on speed dial. You have direct communication with her. You're not uh, dealing with someone out of uh, Volusia. Um, it just makes no no sense whatsoever to change companies during this time. Um, and I just think you have to leave it with the waste approach. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next speaker, please. Silvia Puglisi, I am one of the residents that has been served in an excellent manner by Waste Pro for 15 years, I think it is. I never had a complaint. When there was the COVID, they never failed to come. And if they had an inconvenience that they might, they might miss you call them, and very rarely happen, they come immediately and, and pick up whether it's next day or give you a logical explanation. Uh, one other thing, what about the city? What about the city policy of spend local, buy local, uh, uh, create jobs? All of them live in Palm Coast. My, my, my driver over there lives in Palm Coast. I call him my driver because I, I really care for all of them. They do an excellent job. What is happening here with the administration on which originally, the first original bid that was deemed no good, a Waste Pro was the cheapest of the two from FCC and Waste Pro. Oh, but that bid was not good, was scraped away. Now they come up with some other, and now I never heard before that you get bids and then the, the favorite bid is allowed to or make an adjustment on the bidding price. This is, excuse me, this is cheating. It's cheating because you don't do that on bids, Mr. Mayor, you know that. You're a business person. I've been in business in my life on bids and everything, and you don't do that. What is happening with our, admin, with our administration? We need these good people to continue serving us. They have the best recommendation from everything is us that we know how they serve us. One other thing that I heard today, I have a, a, a 5,000, uh, 15,000 square feet lot. I have a lot of trimming to do because I have a lot of plants and trees. I do it myself. Now they're gonna cut down with the new one, the, the volume of, of the, the yard debris, and for that I'm gonna have to pay higher. Come on, let's do the right thing. Let's hear the residents, please, let's keep Waste Pro, they are excellent. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next speaker, please. Hello, Mayor, City Council. My What's your name? My name's Sean Sanchez. Not only on my uh, homeowner resident of Palm Coast, I haven't been here as long as some of the others. I've lived in Palm Coast about five years. Um, as a son, a father, a grandfather, all of my family comes. Palm Coast. They all spend time here in this community. And for me, when you're telling me that you want to take my job away from me and send it to a foreign owned company that I've already tried them, they didn't work out for me very well. I left Waste Pro. I went through the pandemic here. It was very hard. My family lost a lot of income because they couldn't procure employment. I didn't have a problem. I stayed employed, but I had to work double because not only did our job double, the garbage doubled. We got wore out. You guys are ready to throw us away. The, the members of this community believe in us, but I feel like the city has turned their back on us. Like some of us have given all we have just to try and be out there. We're not Superman. We're not robots. We're human beings. And some of us put in 70, 80 hours a week. How many of you council members do that for the community? I've only been here in Palm Coast working with Waste Pro. I've been a long time employee with Waste Pro, almost seven years. I've only been in Palm Coast, almost three years, and I am one of the top 
and Google reviews. Very good at my job. I love my community. I don't want double the amount of trucks in this city destroying the roads. Do we really want to put another 25 trucks going up and down the most dangerous highway in Florida, jeopardizing more lives? Honestly, I love Palm Coast, but I won't go work for another company just because they're going to try and take my job here. I'm going to stay with Waste Pro. I'm Waste Pro for life. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, please. Steve Carr, Palm Coast. Not long ago, long ago, I went to uh, Waste Pro uh, plant over play business over there in Pinnell and went through the tour. It's amazing what they have done. It is really amazing what uh, Waste Pro has done. And they are so proud of every employee. They don't talk just about their business. They talk about their people. That's what we need to be doing. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, sir. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Danielle. I've been a resident of Palm Coast since 1992. You know, when Walmart used to be Staples and the only movie theater we had at, at the St. Joe's Plaza was where the grumpy old man would tell you to empty your pockets as a kid and only showed three movies. I've attended Wadsworth Elementary, Buddy Taylor, and I'm a graduating class of FPC in 2001. I served four years in the United States Navy, 10 years as a federal police officer, all while raising my girls in Palm Coast. Bought my home in the Peace Section in 2011. It wasn't until a few, few years later I decided I live in Palm Coast, I spend my money in Palm Coast, I might as well work in Palm Coast. So I started my career at Waste Pro. One might think a career at Waste Pro? Yes, a career at Waste Pro. Just because we pick up trash doesn't mean we are trash. I will be graduating at the end of this year with a PhD in forensic psychology, and I choose to service the community I live in. Both my daughters attend school in Palm Coast, where Waste Pro proudly interacts and sponsors many school activities and functions, such as the FPC Starlets. Last year, we conducted a presentation at Wadsworth for the STEM program with Mr. Martin about why we should recycle. It was a great turnout, and the kids loved it, the big green truck that they could throw the rec recycle in the hopper. Waste Pro has hometown heroes, people who care about the residents they service and live next to. One of the Waste Pro crews put out a fire not too long ago, not because they had to, but because they chose to. Waste Pro also has a safe driver program that encourages our drivers as they ride through servicing the local neighborhoods we live in and our kids play in to be safe. In closure, I would like to add that through this pandemic, the blood, sweat, and tears, my team and myself <laughs> have put been through, we were not perfect, but we remain a team. So whether we remain waste pro of Palm Coast, we will remain waste pro. Hold on, please, please don't, please don't. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for next uh, speaker, please. Good evening, everyone. Dennis McDonald. The, and sitting here listening to this thing, um, one of the things that hasn't come forward is it's a sense of fairness on all five of your part to do the right thing here. These people had the lowest bid, but yet somehow or other it got concocted into coming in 20 cents lower. Um, it's almost an embarrassment to say that. Um, you, you're going to change or considering changing contracts for what amounts to be less than 1%. Is that how you guys buy gas, too? Um, now, this is absolutely in insanity. But these people are, have been part of our community for so many years. And I can tell you, with my wife being on the school board, she, she speaks very highly of the things that go on with Waste Pro and how they support things in the schools. Um, I can't think of a, a worse mistake to make than to change for what amounts to be less than 1%. The thing I can tell you is a developer for many, many years, and what went on with this contract, seems to me it's cooking the books in short order. Um, how it can come in 
lower and then all of a sudden get turned around for less than 1%? Think about that, gentlemen. This, is, this isn't fair is what it comes down to. You wouldn't want to be treated this way. So, and in closing, I just want to make one other point. Okay. This probably will never happen again, but I agree with what Mr. Blow said tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public that would like to comment to City Council at this time? Yes, sir. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. My name is Brian Lynch. I am the uh, RVP for Waysboro for Northeast for the Northeast Region, and uh, I'd like to say my Waysboro team and I appreciate the opportunity to service this city, this fine city, and we appreciate the opportunity we had to bid on the solid waste and recycling service for the city of Palm Coast. We want to continue our long-standing relationship with you. As haulers, we are expected and required to exactly follow the specifications of the RFP, and we would like to be provided with a fair and equitable review. We're very disappointed with the results of this process and the committee's recommendation. On May the 12th, during the evaluation committee meeting, Waste Pro was ahead in total points by over two and our total proposal rate for service was a million dollars in total savings for, for a year compared to our competitor. Continuing the process, both haulers were invited to participate in presentations to the committee, 45 minutes. At the end, it was a switch, and FCC began leading the numerical scoring, and WastePro still provided a service rate of a million less to the city. We were a million less a year lower than FCC, as a result of what appears to be negotiations with staff, it appears FCC was allowed to reduce the rate to 21 cents per home, less per month than WastePro bid. WastePro was not afforded the same opportunity to negotiate with city staff. We learned of this significant price drop resulting from the, res of the uh, negotiation through the city agenda, and there was an article published over the weekend. So Waste Pro again was not afforded that same opportunity. In a normal RFP process, and when two vendors are in such tight proximity regarding the numerical scoring, a municipality would allow both proposals to place a best and final price per home. I come here tonight wondering and asking why weren't we given the same opportunity as our competitor to negotiate the best and, uh, and final price. A couple of other things to note, as the current hauler for years, WastePro knows the number of people and trucks it takes to successfully service this community. WastePro proposed 24 trucks while our competitor indicated they required 29. We are able to operate with fewer trucks because we operate in a county and utilize local facilities for disposal such as ELS. We ask that you award the work to us tonight, enter into negotiations with us, or at the very least, allow us to participate in the best and final pricing. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other speakers, any other members of the public that would like to speak to City Council at this time? Yes, ma'am.
my profession went through the same thing that Waste Pro did. We had no staff, working all these hours just to try to make sure that our customers and our patients were taken care of like they should be. Like others have stated, there's was mistakes that were made, but it's hard when you're trying to get employees and they're just not out there to get. Waste Pro has become a family to us. Uh, we're the management is a sweet, <laughs> nice to us, good to us. Um, my husband and my son are not going anywhere. Waste Pro is where they will stay. And I think 16 years of service should mean something. Thank, Thank you. you for your uh, comment. Um, is there another speaker? Yes, ma'am. Hello, I'm Carolyn Ricacci. I'm Palm Coast resident since 2009. What was your name again? I'm sorry. Carolyn Ricacci. Um, I have this big, long speech that I timed out for two minutes and 50 seconds, but <clears throat> everything that I have on this piece of paper is, is standing behind or sitting behind me. This is my family and my, my every day. I started working at Waste Pro in 2013. I didn't even know that there was this was a thing before that. Um, and this company and this, these people have taught me so much of how to be a person, be part of a community, be just there for each other. When somebody calls out sick or somebody has an issue or somebody has COVID and they're out for two weeks or however long, a month, these guys will back each other, pick up the routes, be out there 12 hours a day, be there until the last minute that we're allowed to be in the city. And if we have to, we are there the very next morning picking up whatever we weren't able to do. But we have obviously gotten better. We've hired the people, we've gotten the bodies here. We want to be here. I am, if we aren't gonna be here, we are all still going to be Waste Pro. But we, we may lose some residents. We may have to move to other cities where our divisions are, where we can still be with our family. And you're gonna lose our, 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 in, our incomes, our taxes, our fun money, when we want to go out and have a good time, blow off some steam, we're going to go do that somewhere else. I don't want to do that. I want to raise my children here. I want them to go to Wadsworth and be Panthers, and I want them to be a part of this community. My daughter's five years old, and me and her will go out in the neighborhood with a little bucket and our gloves on, and we'll go pick up trash, and she just thinks it's the best thing ever. My three-year-old son doesn't say a lot, but when he sees a truck, he goes, Mommy's work! And he absolutely loves this company. My whole family loves this company. My whole family's standing behind me. Um, like I said, I have all kinds of statistics and things for you, but that's all I have to say is, is yes, we will be Waste Pro family. They, we will not be going anywhere else. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, please. <coughs> yes, good evening. Charles Merkley, FCC Director of Municipal Sales. 6238 Yellowstone Drive, Port Orange, Florida. I would just like to make a couple comments. Uh, obviously, we, we've heard a lot tonight. And FCC negotiated, went with the city on a fair process, not once, but twice. We went through this FCC, or this RFP process. And we've heard a lot about local employees and local communities. And I believe if you would check everywhere we work, we ingrain ourselves in the communities. Uh, Yes, we talk about going from Volusia to here, which is not an hour and a half to the landfill, but I just wanted to correct that record. Uh, but if you look at the routing scheme we did and how that loops, we start out, we come here, we loop back, and our yard's on the way back from the landfill. So we're very excited about coming here and being a partner with your city. Uh, some of our management team has collected this city, including myself previously. Uh, we understand what community is. We understand about employees. We understand about relationships. We can start relationships just like Waste Pro or any competitor we compete with, with any city we go into. So with some local knowledge, we, we understand the routing. We understand what we did. We understand why there's five more routes. 
less people, less homes, it equals less time on the route, which gives you more time to travel. So I just want to close by saying FCC is looking forward to being your partner for the next period of time over this contract. And you will have a local flavor and you will have lo local people working this contract. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next speaker, please. Sanders. Um, I've been in Palm Coast for about 11 years. Um, when I started off, I was with Waste Management for seven of those years for Waste Management Disposal out of Ormond Beach. I stayed in Ormond Beach for seven years, Palm Coast. When y'all presented the homestead program to rehabilitate Palm Coast, I moved here with my family. Seeing the guys on Waste Pro Truck, hey, um, how much is they paying up there? I said, all right. You know what, the price didn't really matter. And while I'm getting with price don't matter, I hear everybody saying, I don't got on a suit and tie. I'm not finna talk about price. I'm not a math physician, okay? I'm talking about the truth is, yes, they're gonna put out more trucks. But when a storm hit, are those trucks gonna stay to clean up your city? Are they gonna come in on a Sunday and clean up your city? If they trucks break down, Okay, yeah, they're gonna have more trucks come and help, but is the job gonna get done? You can't predict that. You cannot predict anything with garbage. Garbage is unpredictable. I've been with garbage for 14 years. I was a swing driver, I was a supervisor. I, I ran all the routes, commercial, front load, anything can happen in garbage. Yes, both companies, pros and cons. All I keep hearing is about price. And to me, it seems like price is not the matter because people and social media are still saying they're going to go with AC FCC, even though they're a penny under us. What about the safety? What about us cleaning up your city time after time, in after in, day out after day out, dedicating, stand out. Yes, I know the driver's time, 14 hours of drive clock, right? Call my boss. Hey, turn that down to seven. I got one more section. Let me get it up. One more section. That could take an hour. That could take 30 minutes. But I'm out there dedicating myself while my family's at home waiting on me to clean up this city. Why? Because the next day we come in, we can start fresh. When a storm hits, we right here. Soon as the storm over, we already in the city because we live here. They're going to have to travel. You think I'm going to get in my truck, go through all that debris to travel to Daytona just to come back and going through all that debris and all that hazard? I'm not doing it. I know a lot of these guys are not doing it. And it's it just garbage is unpredictable. Please remember that. Anything can happen with garbage. That's all I have. Thank you for your comment. Is there anyone else from the public that would like to see us, ma'am? Oh. Good evening, Mayor, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ron Wilson. I'm a former FCC employee, now employed with Waste Pro. Very happy, great pay. I have a peace of mind. And as a driver, you need that when you're out there on the road. Great, I have great drivers I work with now. The people in Palm Coast are great. And one thing I will say about Flagler County, the garbage is much cleaner up here than it is in Volusia County. That's all I got to say. Good night. Thank you for your comment. Hi, Lauren Jones. Um, I know we've heard a lot tonight about Waste Pros being invested in the community, and I'm one of those community members they're invested in. They sponsor my bowling team, so it's my shirt tonight. But also a little bit of a different perspective than what I've heard tonight, because I know on social media, when after the pandemic and everything, and times were tough for everybody, a lot of the comments that we saw out there socially about Waste Pro were negative. And 
that's not the case anymore. They're, the comments that I read recently on the Flagler Live article were positive and were all in support of Waste Pro. And so I think here what you've got is you've got a company that has the proven track record that listens to the community, that listens to their clients, and makes the necessary changes to improve what the, to improve their services. And FCC may do that. We don't know much about them because they've never been here, but you've already got this built in here in our community. And that's kind of my biggest takeaway just as a community member. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there, yes, ma'am. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. Um, my perspective is coming from a, a couple of different areas. Um, I've been a resident of Palm Coast since 2009. I rented a home here in Palm Coast before buying a home. I never have once had an issue with our garbage um, driver or helper. And as you all know, they change over time. They take different routes. Um, I, we've never had an issue. One of the things that I'm kind of embarrassed to admit is I never realized the, the job that they have and how we take it for granted as a resident. Um, I am also a government employee. I work for the Flagler County Clerk of Court. I've worked there for 11 years. I work in the air conditioning. I have never experienced what these employees have experienced. In 2009, I'm sorry, 2017, my perspective changed even more because I became a wife of a waste probe driver. I am one of the ones who have a very dedicated employee, or I'm sorry, a dedicated um, husband who was a dedicated employee of Waste Pro. He was the, one of the ones who refused to come in, even though there may be set hours. But if it's just a little bit more to get it up and start over, to make the customers happy, to eliminate the complaints, he's gonna do that where he is late for dinner, where he is late for gymnastics competitions, where he is unable to attend those things because he is a dedicated employee who does not call out, who has been there through the pandemic, been there through, you know, a lot of these things that are being complained about. But one of the things is that as not only a resident and a wife, we're out in the community because we are the residents. We go to Publix, we're in Walmart, <laughs> we're at Palm Coast Gymnastics. They know this local person is their driver, is they know, hey, do you know who, you know, this day, hey, matter of fact, I get a text message on my day off, hey, is Waste Pro working um, on, on 4th of July? Because online it says no, and yeah, they're working. Hey, can you ask Brad this? Can you do this? He's a, they're, they're all local members of the community that, that their job doesn't stop when they clock out at Waste Pro. They get the questions asked when they're in the local stores. They get it asked, you know, everywhere that they are. And I'm just asking that you guys take into consideration that they love this community and that they, they do a good job. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there another speaker? Hi, my name is Mindy Mercer. I've been with Waste Pro for going on almost four years, five years. Um, I started off as dispatcher, um, so I've been on the side where I have to answer the complaints and the, <coughs> the comments of the residents. Um, I've seen both sides of it, and 90% of the time, the customers are very understanding of where we come through. Um, so behind me is my entire Waste Pro family that we have stuck together through thick and thin, through everything, through ups and downs. We're not going anywhere. I also would like to point out, I'm not trying to down FCC, but I see suits here. I don't see their, their employees standing behind them like she does. There's 50 Please. employees standing here to support our, our company, our family. I don't see that with them. So we want to stay here and support our community. We all live here. We all want to be here. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. My name is Ted Phillips. I've been a Palm Coast 
resident for just a little over three months. Um, been employed with Waste Pro for about two months. Um, prior to this, I was a city employee, refuse department, garbage man for life, 27 years. Um, through my experience of being a garbage man, I learned that you have to have dedication, loyalty, and commitment, and also customer service. Like she stated earlier, look at our customer service, look at our loyalty, look at our commitment. You know what I'm saying? we got every one of our fellows here, after doing a 10-hour route today, and boiling ass heat, sorry, Lord, sorry, <laughs> burning down heat, they're here to show support for us. You know, in, in my 27 years, I've watched many of mayors, many of councilmen come and go, and I've also seen their mentality go from customer service, loyalty, and commitment to the community, to, to themselves. I hope this is not what I'm seeing here. Let's keep this and give Waste Pro what they deserve. They're here. They're going to take care of you guys. I've seen it my, my first hand in the two months I've been here. I would go to war with any one of them guys, and I don't know them all that well. But I can tell you what, they got a family heart, and they ain't going nowhere. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public that would like to comment? I've been a Palm Coast resident for seven years now, and I think it'd be a big mistake to change. One of the particular reasons when I was in business, I would get bids, I'd throw out the highest one, and I'd throw out the lowest one, make a decision from within the other ones. Corey, um, one of the people on the truck, is very listen on his pickup. If he sees something laying on the ground, he picks it up, puts it in a trash truck. I had a renter next door to me to let her wine bottles blow all over the place on, on recycling day and never pick them up. Corey would chase them after him in the neighborhood and pick them up and put them in the truck. So they, they, they are good people. They try. A lot of the people that are complaining just don't pack the stuff up as requested in the water bill. Tie it up. Smash it down. <coughs> put it in a proper bin. They put it in plastic bags. You don't know whether it's recycling or trash. So it's 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 it's, it's Thing that has to be implemented more for the people to understand how to put the trash out, when to put it out, and tie it up properly. I sent you a picture of a, of a big pile of trash people put out. They just can't handle that. They have to pick it up individually. It's not tied up. It's strewn. I had a section, what was that, 20 feet long by 8 feet high? You know, they, they, just, they can't do it. It's, it's just impossible to keep the timing within that spectrum. So you just need to decide properly to train the people to put the trash out properly in the proper barrels, smash it down instead of putting the whole box out, and, and it would go a lot easier for everybody, and there wouldn't be any complaints. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Yes, sir. Hello, David Ramirez, FCC, Senior Logistics Engineer. I was part of the RFP process, and we want to thank the city for the opportunity. Uh, but also, we've heard a lot of the comments that Waste Pro uh, and their employees have said and their families have said, and we want to reassure them. There's a reason why we designed our service the way we did. We've heard, and you've heard a lot of comments about 13, 14, 15 hour, 15 hour days. In addition to that, you've heard things about safety. It's not safe when you design a service to run that long. And that is why we've designed the service the way we have. We want City of Palm Coast employees to continue to, to serve and live here and be able to enjoy those times and that time with their family. So they're not missing those dinners. So they're not missing those events. That is why the service is designed as is, to provide the City of Palm Coast with a quality service at the best rate. You're talking about five to six more routes operating daily ensuring that those drivers are going to get home at a reasonable time. We compete with WastePro in many contracts. Sometimes they beat us in the RFP process, sometimes we beat them. It's very natural in this environment. But where we compete with them at a local level, we are always the qualified or the better provider of service. 
please speak with your staff in regards to that. Multiple contracts where we had less performance issues compared to Waste Pro, all of which have been vetted out by your city staff and by the RFP process. And the reason for that is because of how we designed the service. We understand that this wasn't a bid. It wasn't the lowest price. It was an RFP process. And in that RFP process, there's a lot of things to consider, not only price, although it's important. How is the city going to get collected? How is the service going to get achieved? How many resources are vendors providing? And so those were the things that were factored into here. And so because of that, we ask that you please follow the, uh, the, the uh, recommendation of your city staff uh, that it's not just about price, but really it's about the entire service that's being provided. And we look forward to the opportunity of working with you if, if you still choose. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public? Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Tim Dolan, Vice President of Governmental Affairs for WastePro. <clears throat> Just want to address a couple of the comments that were made. The dedication these guys talked about with running the long routes, I heard a lot of those same comments tonight. Those comments were when we dealt with COVID, when we had people out, when we were running short. Okay, we're not in that situation right now. Um, COVID has subsided. Okay, we've readjusted our routes per our proposal that's come in. And again, I can't emphasize enough, we're running five fewer trucks. That's 10 fewer employees that can call out every day. That's 10 fewer employees that won't show up to work. That's 10 fewer people we don't have to hire. And that's because we're not driving up here from Volusia County every day. There's travel time involved. That extra travel time means they have trucks on the road because they're while they're while they're driving up and down the road we're picking up trash okay that's that's really the difference of it if a truck breaks down we're five minutes away from a road call they're a half hour to 40 minutes away okay <clears throat> we're dumping at the local landfill if they have to break off a route to go dump they're driving down to Volusia County and then have to turn around and come back up here to town folks that's why extra equipment has to be run <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with the routes we run we are currently doing this contract we know what it takes to do the contract um, and, and that's all I really got to say thank you thank you for your comment any other members of the public like to uh, speak to City Council at this time Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Mitch Dahlstrom. I'm the Regional Director of Operations in Florida for FCC. And, uh, you know, I really respect a lot of comments made. Uh, there's a lot of passionate people here uh, on behalf of their company. Uh, I want to let you know that we also have a lot, of, a lot of passionate people also with FCC Environmental all across Florida. We've worked many different transitions from uh, different companies across the state. And I just want to assure you that uh, we put our people first. Uh, their first and their safety is more important than, than anything else above that aspect. Where we do compete with Waste Pro, as David stated, um, you know, we compare and, and we perform much better on the level of service. We are our model, our business model with uh, what we do with the number of trucks. We can just handle the growth, the future growth of Palm Coast by having that much more equipment and personnel. So I just wanted to come up and uh, assure you both that we are looking forward to uh, uh, the partnership in the future and we're definitely going to be part of uh, the community also. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak to City Council at this time? Seeing none, I will close public comment and return to City Council. First, um, are there questions of, uh, of staff? Uh, I, I don't have questions, but I do have comments I want to make. When so hold the, just for a second, just, sure. uh, any specific questions of uh, of staff first, if we could? Yes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> even be, even before I make those questions, 
uh, before I pose them. I just want to let it be known that I, at no time did I speak with anyone from Westboro or FCC other than the drivers that go by my place and when it's really hot and I'm out there, I make sure I offer them water. That's the only time I spoke with this, with this guy. Which, by the way, I appreciate your job. Reminds me of that little story of the kid and his father. That's the kid says to the father, here comes the garbage people. Father correct them, uh-uh, we are the garbage people. We create the garbage. They're here to help us. They're here to clean the stuff we do. So having that said, uh, this is a, a big process, OK? Uh, the questions I have is I would like to have a, a, little, a little better explanation as to why uh, Westboro is stating that FCC's contracts are going to cost us a million dollars more. Can you just elaborate on that? I know you did before, but so this way I'm a little more uh, uh, enlightened about this. And I, then I have just another two other questions. They're pretty easy. Yes, Vice Mayor. So that was a calculation, I believe they stated as much, that uh, taking the initial bids that were received, not the final negotiated cost with FCC, but the difference between the initial bid received from WastePro and the initial uh, price received from FCC, that was the delta okay. in one year of service. There's one, uh, uh, one other question that I heard here today that, uh, you know, FCC does not have full-time helpers. Are you familiar with that, or is that something you're familiar with? So that is that is not correct, and as a matter of fact, in the uh, contract documents, it states that if they are going to use temp help for any reason, that they have to uh, notify the city in advance before that takes place. All right, so then, uh, uh, and this is the most important questions. I just heard it today, I believe, by a uh, gentleman by the name Brian and uh, Mr. Tim, which, by the way, I don't, want to, I don't want you to forget that the last time you were here that I, me and the mayor asked you enthusiastically to see what you could do for us price-wise, and you were firm on that. My question is, I heard it here tonight, that we did not afford the same opportunity to Waste Pro as we did to FCC. Is that correct, sir? So, Vice Mayor, what we did was we followed the city's uh, procurement policies and procedures, which states that the, uh, the apparent winner is uh, issued a notice of intent to award. Uh, if no protests are received, we will enter into negotiations with them at that time. Now, if those negotiations do not prove fruitful, we would end negotiations and then go to the second rated bidder. Uh, that did not take place uh, in this RFP process because negotiations were fruitful with the top-rated proposer. But then here, it's my confusion then. Let's say we don't approve FCC tonight. Where we stand? So, Vice Mayor, let's, uh, let's call on uh, City Manager. I'd like you to <clears throat> comment on the transparency and the procedure and process documented for the RFP bids because I think there's there's been some twists and turns in the concept and the understanding of it. Can you uh, comment on your oversight of the RFP process? Yes, I would just echo <clears throat> what Mr. Mansell um, put from a groundwork of the RFP process. So when a RFP um, process begins, it really is in the house of that document, the provisions, and it is in line with our procurement process. So that becomes the letter of the law as we move forward to make sure that there's transparency and there's fairness and there's definitely the accountability throughout the process. And with all that said, if we do not follow that process and the addendums and all of those measures, then it undermines the integrity of the overall process, and I hope that was helpful. So, uh, so it's so I understand <clears throat> it's standard RFP process documented in the city that <clears throat> once the intent to bid is awarded, there is there can be there is subsequent negotiation. Is that is that correct? So it's a mayor. This is, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Councilor. 
So what Denise said is correct. The procedure is laid out in our procurement policies and in the actual RFP itself, and it's very specific as to the process that needs to be followed, as to the meeting of the committee that ends up reviewing these proposals and chooses them. They are assessed a point value on five different categories. It is a very specific and long process, and the companies that provide their proposals, these proposals are very in-depth, and they are required to meet to a T every single form and response and question has to be answered that's in the RFP. Once all that's done and there's been a review of those and then been point value assessed, if the committee that's doing the review so decides, they can ask for oral presentation. That was done in this case because they were so closely aligned. After oral presentation, our procedure states that you do a re-evaluation of all those categories and assign certain point values, and then after that, whichever company comes out on top is issued a notice of intent to award, and then negotiations start after that. All this was specifically followed in this case. The city did everything it was supposed to do in the procedure, and I think that's evidenced by the fact that no bid protest was received because we followed everything we were supposed to do pursuant to our policies because this is what we're required to do to make sure there's transparency in the process and that we are getting the best deal and the best service on any type of contract of this amount, which is this is a huge contract, so there's a lot of procedure involved here. All those were followed. Coming to what has occurred today, which is the manifestation of all that effort with the company that came out on top. Thank you, Counselor. Any questions for... I do. I have just a handful of questions. Is this for City Council or... Staff. For staff. For staff, yep, regarding the scoring process, and these kind of came up through the discussions tonight. As far as the way that these are scored just for the process and for transparency, is it from Chapter 1 to Chapter 10 in order? Like, as these are being reviewed, do we go top-down in the scoring rubric? I see the Chapter 1 through Chapter 10. Do we go top-down? It's not exactly, but we did lay out in the RFP which chapters fell under which of those five broad categories for scoring purposes. Okay, so then when individuals are scoring these, would they go, I don't want to say chronologically, but, you know, would they do Chapter 1, Chapter 2, Chapter 3, and then into these five different categories? They would know which chapters fall into those five categories, so they would all be looking at the same chapters to do the scoring for the same criteria. There were a couple chapters that didn't affect scoring. It was a, did you fill it out or not? Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. And then the scoring criteria that is used in Chapter 10, the rate total per household per month, could you explain the formula for this? So WastePro received maximum points because they were the lowest initially to bid, so they submitted a bid of 32, 33, and they were awarded the 20 points. And FCC submitted a bid with $34.64 per household, and they received 18.67 of those points. So that's a difference of, well, if we're trying to convert dollar to point value, is this a linear or exponential degradation, if that makes sense? And the procurement department is the one who actually did the scoring, but I think the weighting you just described, I believe, is accurate. Do you know if there was anything different than what you just said? I mean, I think it is just that you get 20 points if you're the lowest price, and then it's a ratio of points for however much more expensive you are for the other one. Understood. So my question is really just kind of leading back to what WastePro would have had to submit as a number to have been considered the number one bidder. So if this was, so if 18.67 points were for $2.31 over, it's not 20 minus $2.31. There has to be some type of common denominator here that we're reducing these numbers by, if this makes sense, because GFL 
they were awarded uh, 17 points, but they were uh, six dollars, well, five dollars and whatever, uh, 67 cents um, higher. So I was just trying to, in my head, think of the number that WastePro would have had to submit their bid with that would have given them the most points. Just, and I think that number is somewhere around 29.97, but I'm not certain, and I just wanted to have more clarification on how that works, just so that we can be completely transparent. And if we had gone with you know our the best offer first, what would have gotten them to be on top of FCC? So you're trying to correlate the um, the uh, the point with the the bid offer? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Because if I had entered yeah. you know a dollar, like how many? So unfortunately, it's not as linear as as you're describing yeah. a process, uh, and that is evident to see. Uh, as we go through all of the areas that are scored by the evaluators and then the adjustment made through uh, clarifications that we're giving during oral presentations, um, it, you know, it, it, it varies a little more than a linear equation, you know, based on strictly price like you're describing. Understood. And, and my understanding is that the bonfire system itself did the math on the price scoring, but I, we'd have to confirm that with procurement. But I think there is, I'm not sure exactly what that formula is that you're Gotcha, because I think the majority of these other categories could be considered, um, I don't want to say subjective, because they're all, doc, you know, they're all evidence-based, but there's a little bit of, uh, you know, nuanced uh, minutia that goes around with all of them, but I thought the dollar value would be pretty solidified so that we could at least have a number of what they would need to come in at to have uh, exceeded the, uh, what number was it like? Uh, so they needed to make up, um, about two points, so it was eighty-seven twenty to eighty-nine oh uh, seven. So they needed, yeah, a dollar or almost two two total points. So what would have the number been to get them to that number? Um, if it's not exactly linear, then it's a little bit more than the three dollar reduction in their uh, bid offering. But um, I just wanted to have that out there, just for for clarification, but also just so that we could all know what number would they have had to come in at to be the number one uh, bidder? Because I think that was a number that's somewhat closer to their current bridge contract. Yeah, but I, I still think, I, and I want to emphasize this point, uh, was everything that was done was done transparently. Yep. Because here tonight, somebody said that we appear to be cooking the books. I don't think we're cooking the books. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I do have a couple questions for staff. Go ahead. Um, two, two things. Um, Matt, when you gave us our briefing, and I, and I want to thank your team. I know you worked really hard on this. I know this is a difficult process. Absolutely. But when you briefed each of us individually last week, you mentioned the technology. You mentioned the cameras. You said that WastePro does not have the same technology that FCC, but yet tonight we heard from WastePro saying they actually do have that same technology. So can you clarify that for me? Yes, Councilman. It is not that they do not have the same technology. It's the way that they uh, allow staff to interact with that technology. So the current process um, is that if we need to see uh, pictures or video that we would request that and that they would uh, either pull that up on their uh, iPads, I believe, uh, you know, or uh, you know, bring their computer to us and show us, uh, but they would not allow us to have that. You cannot log in from our computers to their system? Correct. Yeah, if you want to explain a little further on that. Currently, uh, WastePro does have... Uh, Intr introduce, your, introduce yourself for us, please. Uh, Alyssa Roscoe, I'm Citizen Engagement Analyst. I'm acting as a solid waste supervisor currently. Um, the current provider does have those processes, but the receiving of them, um, cases are entered, and then we they can upload their documentation to it. Videos are a little bit more difficult due to file yeah. sharing size. Those do have to be provided in person. Uh, but they can upload it, uh, pictures and what we call cookie trails, which are the GPS mapping points of the... So pages. you basically can get what you need? The end result, you can receive the same information. Okay, and, and my other question is, if we don't approve this tonight, what happens? Or maybe our attorney could answer that, or maybe Denise can. Yeah. You want to go to... Uh, I, I would advise to let our legal counsel provide any counsel could you answer that question for us if they're um, just a, an assumption if if City Council was unable to make a decision this evening what transpires 
So um, we've been, so I mean, I guess the question would have to be asked to the city council, what would need to be, in what was provided as far as the RFP goes, are there other um, metrics that the city needs to look at in deciding who the solid waste hauler should be? Um, we've been through this process now um, twice, or not, didn't get through it the first time fully due to the bid protest and the lack of information on the um, responsive parties. But now we've been through a successful um, process. There's been no protest. Um, there's a contract in front of you. So if the contract's not approved, that's in front of you, then there would need to be direction by city council as to what further needs to occur. However, whatever that direction is, needs to be done through our required procurement procedure. Thank you, council. Uh, giving everybody, okay. Um, so, so, I, I, the, so, so the weight of the decision is on the shoulders of City Council yep. this evening. Got it. I think City Council has been clear that unless there's a specific metric um, that has not been presented that I, I is think key to your decision making, yeah. then the decision needs to be here at City Council. I, I, I think we've seen a metric that wasn't presented and I think it's right in front of us tonight. You know, when I walked in here, I didn't, after, the, after your briefing, and it was a great briefing, and you guys worked really hard, I was pretty much, well, you know, they've, they've done all this work, and, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be. And then I spotted the gentleman that picks up my trash twice a week, that comes off the back of that truck and picks up that garbage can. And then I realized that all you folks, you live, you work, and you play here in Palm Coast. You spend your tax dollars in this town. You, you go out to our businesses. Um, you're part of this community, and I just got to be honest with you. After all the years that they have served us, after going through COVID, uh, and that was really tough. But I got to tell you, that whole period of time, you never mi missed a trash pickup or recycle pickup, at least in my neighborhood. Um, so I, I have to be very honest and very frank here and to the point. Um, I cannot vote for this contract, and, and I'm sorry. And to the young lady who served in my United States Navy, thank you. So, um, Councilman Finelli. So, our strategic plan states that we have a procurement process to get high value contracts for the city of Palm Coast, and that process was followed. The, the one thing that, that kind of sticks in my mind is um, waste Waste Pro alluded to the fact that they didn't have an opportunity to, to negotiate their lowest and best price. Um, and not having to run to Daytona and, and being local in the city, I mean, I, I'm, I can't understand why Waste Pro didn't come in significantly lower than a hauler that's got to run back and forth to Daytona and, and pay, pay for all that drive time, fuel, cost on the trucks. So I'm kind of stuck on that point of, of why they weren't able to come in so much lower. That, and that's, that's really where I'm at. Like we have another company here who's gonna provide more trucks, shorter routes, all these things, and they were able to come in at a lower price than Waste Pro. Councilman Klufus, you haven't had a chance yet, please. Uh, yeah. I. I'm in the same same boat here. So the problem is, and it's it's terrible, is that we're looking at the result of a, and this isn't terrible, the result of a fortified process that's in place. And when we're trying to compute, you know, the, we can't enumerate or put a value on all these individuals who are in our community. They're tremendous. And, you know, my hat's off to all the service that's been provided. You're great individuals and you help keep the city at a level of, Palm Coast that we all come to expect. Um, but again, I also fall back to my metric where I was trying to figure out even if these resources, uh, the resource category were uh, unchanged where potentially, <clears throat> there, I was thinking about more trucks being detrimental to the streets and things like that and whether the resources actually were um, 
long-term beneficial, and it would make sense in my head that uh, they won't be overlapping on the same city streets, so you're going to have the same total net wear of a 35,000-pound car uh, truck on our streets, as long as there's no overlap. More trucks want to cause more issues that way. On the highway, is a different story. Um, <clears throat> but again, I'm coming back to the realization that if there's a, a number that we can calculate that would have put them ahead, what would that number have been, and whether or not that was much, much lower than the uh, rate increase from May 1st, and I don't suspect that it actually is, and that's the most troubling part, is that the way that our bid process is set up is that the individuals who are given the uh, intent to award have the ability to negotiate contracts uh, afterwards, and I think it's a very prudent negotiation con uh, concept that happened because el everyone was scored on the prices that they submitted, but at the end of the day, FCC came back and made sure that they were at least a penny lower so that outwardly they can say, hey, our submission was, we are paying less th than what you would have been paying with WastePro. And whether there's an asterisk on that, of course there's an asterisk on that. But at the end of the day, if the submission had been at this dollar value that I'm trying to uh, compute, I, we wouldn't be sitting here, and uh, that's troublesome to me. And but again, I have, we have to have faith in the procurement process, especially for contracts that are this large. And it seems like uh, the lack of bid protests indicate that everything was uh, upheld to a level of integrity that we come to expect at the city. And looking through the documentation, I don't really see anything that is glaring that was there was no mispropriety uh, behavior or anything like that. Uh, so I come back to the fact that we need to respect our bidding process and as much as that literally stinks and just sucks to say, but it's, and I say that sincerely, is that I'm sitting here apologizing for us having to follow our, appro our procurement process. And that's uh, where I come from. Thank you, Council. I, I, you know what, it <clears throat> rips me inside to have to make a decision. It does, but it's our job. It's what you elect us for. In one side, uh, the balance, you have a company that either did everything by the book. On the other side, you have a company that's claiming that they were not afforded an opportunity when we just heard they were afforded an opportunity. And he looks straight at these people here. And this, this is the part that actually tears me inside. But that was ways of doing things. I remember once again, I remember when me and the mayor actually asked Waste Pro representatives, enthusiastically was the word used. Please help us out. Do what you have to do. See what you can do. And then to Councilman Fanella's point, to be honest with you, I think they could have done a little better. And for them not to do a little better, some of these people may lose their jobs. So it's, it, it, it tears you inside. But you have to do the job you have to do here. You either go one way or go the other way, but uh, let's see when it comes. All right, Vice Mayor, uh, <clears throat> the, the comment I have, I guess, really covered uh, most everything. And Councillor, um, help me with uh, whether or not I can ask this question. I did hear many, many comments tonight about um, the loyalty that the uh, employees of WASPO feel for their company and, and for their work here. I do have a question. Um, and Councillor, help me if I can ask this question. Has there been transactional engagement between um, Waste Pro and FCC in terms of consolidation or purchasing companies, or has there been, um, um, can I ask that question? Um, Mayor, you can, you can ask it. I don't know that it should go towards any decision making because you have, you know, the standards that were considered by the RFP in front of you, but you can ask the question for informational purposes. I don't think, I don't see anything precluding you from doing that. And, and the purpose of my question is, um, I think everyone up here on City Council obviously looks at the employment of residents as an extremely, extremely important thing, which is why the decision making is so difficult. Um, so, um, Mr. Mansell, are you aware of uh, any any uh, consolidations or any movement from one company um, buying the other company or pieces or anything like that? Uh, I don't have any knowledge on that subject area. I don't either. No. no. Okay. 
All right. I just thought I thought I would ask. All right. I uh, my final comment um, is that um, city manager, I think you have uh, explained the process, and I um, like a loyal family. I also have great the utmost confidence in our city staff. I do believe that the process has been done twice. Um, and I will stand behind um, our city staff and trust their judgment um, and the completion of the RFP process. So with my comments said, I would uh, uh, call a vote. So I would ask for a... Uh, you gotta have a motion first. I would call for the motion, yes. Yeah, Mayor, we need a motion. Yep. I could have the gavel if you want. No, I'm asking for a motion. Well, for posterity, is it also possible that throughout this process we can get that figure that would have put Waste Pro in the lead for this scoring rubric? If we were to look at Kanban or Bonfire um, to see what, and I just want this number outside of this discussion so that there is transparency if they were graded from top to bottom, what would have put them ahead? We should be able to get that from procurement for you. Understood. Thank you. You know, I, I would just say again, we're talking couple of cents difference and waste pros already said they could come back with something better I cannot for the life of me believe that we would throw these people our neighbors out of work for that much of a difference to bring in a company that's not tested I just simply I, not I, I appreciate the comment I it a little bit oversimplified there are there's nothing oversimplified about their jobs and the fact that they're a member of our community. There's nothing oversimplified about that. Well, I guess, I guess, Councilman, the, the reverse would be if the other company had been here for this period of time, you'd probably have exactly the same. Sure. So the metric I'm looking at is that with the additional number of routes and the potential for labor shortage in the future, there is an overlap where um, the company could call on labor from shorter routes to fill the gap. Additionally, the extra equipment and the um, 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 and the fact that you, you made mention that they're unproven. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would counter that it is probably one of the larger companies in the world with a track record. Now, whether or not we've researched and, and read the history of those companies or throughout the state of Florida, I just don't want to gloss over, you know, your, your comment is, is, is valid, but I don't want to make a decision on not having both sides of the conversation presented. Um, so, again, I, I... I just have to tell yeah. Councilman Danko, I mean, I completely agree with you, but you have to understand that the management of Waste Pro should have been a little more on the tippy toes, and they were not. Well, that's And this is that told, may be true. was just told to us over here. When I asked the question, mm -hmm. they were not afford, uh, afford the same opportunity. They were afford, and you had <coughs> staff and our city attorney telling us how the process I, went. I asked okay. for transparency. They said it was transparent. Now, what are we going to tell a company that did everything by the book, did everything the proper way, no, we're not going to take you because the people live in Palm Coast. It tears my heart. It breaks me apart. But what are we going to do? What's the message we're sending out there if we tell, ah, listen, you may be the best, but we don't want you. You may do the things the right way, but we don't want you. And that's the other, yeah, that's what the mayor was saying. There's the other part of it. Well, that, uh, 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 Vice Mayor, and I, I agree with you. Why do we have these processes and follow them if we're not going to go with the outcome of the process? Yep. And that, that's what's killing me because I, I see I see uh, the same you know people you know picking up my trash at my house and and um, and that tears me up because you know I, I believe that they are doing a good job but we have these processes to to acquire the best contract for the city of Palm Coast and the process was followed and. Uh, unfortunately, Waste Pro did not come in with the award-winning proposal. I'd like to comment on the process, because you're right, there is a process. However, we are the final judges of that process.
process. We're part of that process. That's why we're elected. Otherwise, they wouldn't need to bring a contract to us. They need our stamp of approval. So we're here to make sure everything is right. And just because one little bureaucratic snafu or whatever it is, a little missed thing by their management, I'm not going to hold these people responsible for it. We are the final judges of this process. Nobody's holding these people yeah, responsible. Well, we're holding the, the, okay. the management responsible. Right, but we're still the final judges. And it, like I said, it breaks my heart, but I'm going to have to make that motion because I think we should respect those. I respect that. I, okay. We should respect, respect the process. Okay. I, I, we have, and, and we I agree have a motion. All right, we have a motion. I agree okay. with you. I'll make motion. the motion. Okay, there's a motion on the floor, um, and your motion is, can you clarify, to... Uh, motion is to, to approve the, the resolution. One is there a second? I'll second, and I have And a, we have a second, yep, so, so I'll open up for discussion now. Yep. Is it true that back in 2021, November 21, that WastePro had come in at a, a bid with $26.47 to continue service in Palm Coast? If that, it, yep, sorry, Nasa. Yes, it, it, well, I was just going to clarify. It wasn't a bid. It was to extend the current contract that we had with them for a year. And I, you'll have to defer to staff for the exact amount. I thought it was more $29. I'm, I'm not sure. You'll have to defer to, to them. All right, we have, a, um, we have a motion and we have a second. Um, is there any additional discussion before I call for the vote? Well, my, my point was, Mayor, that yeah. if that number, 2647, even was anywhere between 2647 and 2997, I think the arithmetic would work out to that they would have been awarded the contract. And that's the worst part is that it, I'm with you guys. It's terrible to look at these people and, and tell them, hey, if you had come in with a number that was between these two, you would have won. But that's, that's the math that I'm coming out with. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that... If there's no further discussion, then I will ask the clerk for a roll call vote. Vice Mayor Brinkwheel. Yes. Councilmember Denko. No. Councilmember Finelli. Yes. Councilmember Klukas. Yeah. Mayor Alpin. Yes. Motion passes four to one. Okay, we'll continue on with the agenda. If uh, council would read the uh, next uh, resolution into the record for us, please. Yes, the next agenda item is for the E section fiscal sustainability plan, a resolution of the city council of the city of Palm Coast, Florida, approving the fiscal sustainability plan for the E section drainage improvement project, authorizing the city manager or designee to execute the necessary documents providing for severability, providing for conflict, providing for implementing actions, and providing for an effective date. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Andrea Mudrick. I work in the Stormwater and Engineering Department with the City. I am the Project Coordinator. And um, so I'm here to present the Fiscal Sustainability Plan and get approval for that. It's essentially a maintenance plan regarding the E section drainage improvement project. Um, so I'm just gonna go into a little bit of a background of the project. Um, so we have two major freshwater canals in the E section, the East Hampton and Eisenhower canals. And they were dug out uh, at the very beginning of the city's development before it was really a city. 
and they were never properly maintained. So it's been about 50 or so years since there was a proper maintenance plan put in place for these two uh, waterways. Um, over the years, there's been a lot of um, you know, erosion on the canal banks that has occurred. Trees have grown onto the canal banks and they've um, you know, put a lot of leaves, vegetation, silt. It's taken up the capacity of the canals, which was really um, designated to hold and treat stormwater. Um, so we lost a lot of the stormwater storage over the years. So we have worked with a contractor, DRMP. We did this citywide analysis and we pinpointed a couple projects throughout the city that would be really um, beneficial and provide a lot of stormwater treatment and storage. So the E section is one of the neighborhoods that we identified as having a lot of storm, um, or sorry, flooding, localized flooding. So we wanted to address that, and this was one of the projects that was identified that would make a big impact in that area. So you know, we did the legwork, we had it up for bid, that's E. Klein is the contractor who won the project. Um, so they were contracted to do the dredging and the clearing of the two freshwater canals. It's about two and a half miles long. And we also decided to have them replace three of the culvert pipes at the FPL easement, which um, I don't have the pointer, but it's at the top right of the canal. And those pipes were deteriorating um, metal pipes, so we decided to go ahead and include this in the project. Um, we had the project funded by the state revolving fund loan. It's a 0% interest loan given to us by the state. Um, you know, they basically reimburse us for the project throughout the project, and then after a while, we end up paying them back. So that was the funding source we got in order to complete this project. Um, so basically, the uh, project status is that we have finished the project. Uh, as of June 24th, we reached final completion. And right now, what we're trying to do is just close out the project. So we are working with F our representatives from FDEP with the loan. Um, there's some paperwork that we need to complete with them. There's also some paperwork we need to finish with our engineer of record, which is from DRMP, the contractor, who helped us identify this project and also who helped us design this project. Um, so because we're tied into this loan, one of the requirements that we have to, um, it will, sorry, the requirement is to develop and submit a fiscal sustainability plan. It's essentially a maintenance plan at this point. Since we haven't maintained the canals in a very long time, we've got them back to their original condition. You know, we've created the slopes, we've made them real nice and pretty, and so we want to keep them that way. So we came up with this plan. It was required. Um, as far, part of the um, Federal Water Pollution Control Act, which is tied to the loan. Um, so essentially what we had to do is come up with the inventory of the critical assets of the project, which is the Eisenhower Canal, uh, the East Hampton Canal. We've got the new pipes, which are um, 160 linear feet in length total. There's three of them, and they're 72 inches wide. Um, we've got the two head walls. So those are the main um, assets um, of this project. So the evaluation is that everything is very new. So we, you know, if you've read this, the sustainability plan, it kind of goes over that. Everything is, you know, brand new right now. So um, right now, our main goal is the maintenance part. So we want to um, we've written all this into the plan. We're gonna have mowers out there, kind of maintaining the grass. We have cleaning crews in-house who will go in and um, clean out the debris periodically throughout the swales. We have um, all, the, all these systems kind of already put in place within the city and the stormwater. Um, so pipe inspections, we do those on a yearly rotation. And we also have a contract with in-depth diving services. They're a professional diving company. So they come in periodically and they do a more thorough inspection of the pipes. Um, and we also have an aquatic uh, 
a contract with a necrotic aquatic sprayer, so they come in on a 28-day rotation, and they will spray the canals. Um, so it's basically, you know, that document just kind of addresses all those items, how we're going to do the maintenance and where we're going to get the funding from. Um, that is where we sort of lucked out in a way, since we already had all these, um, you know, contracts in place, and we have in-house workers who are already doing a lot of these maintenance activities. With the pipes, they were already inspecting them. We already had our uh, divers going through there every so often, which is how we knew they were in bad condition and needed replacement. Um, so there really isn't any financial implications that we see from the maintenance of this. Um, so, and that's, I mean, that's basically it. So any questions? City Council, questions? Yes, sir. This Mr. Vice Mayor. This is my area. Yes. I live right by that place. Right. And I tell you, we had serious, serious problems with flooding. Uh, it's funny, the other day was raining cats and dogs. Not that I got hit with a Doberman, but uh, it was raining cats and dogs. And uh, the water, the flow, phenomenal. Phenomenal. I'm In very impressed. Very impressed with the job Good. that was done. Good. I'd like to thank Stormwater for the job they did. Thank you. My neighbors you. are pretty happy. We're great. We're really happy to hear that. <laughs> and uh, the timelines were a little off, but uh, that, yes. and now that we're talking about this, was some something happened the other day that you know you have to congratulate your staff. They digging at the end of my street. One of these turtles, huge turtle crawls to uh, Eric Drive. Now my neighbors and I are trying to keep it in, you know, in one of the swells so it sh she doesn't come back to the street. Right. I didn't know what to do, to be honest with you. But I made one phone call. In less than 10 minutes, we had that problem solved. So thank you, Barbara Grossman, and thank you, Shelly, I believe was her name. Was that they the name were of the phenomenal. turtle? Shelly the turtle? No. Uh, <laughs> okay. No. Oh, Shelly. I, I, no, I got you. Oh, okay. No, no. But you know what? You know, on a good sense, on a good note, this was phenomenal. What uh, Barbara goes with it. She, she had it right there. Pretty Thank good. you. That's great. Councilman, question? Nope. I I'll take his word for it. Councilman Finelli. Thank you for fixing a 15-year-old problem and bringing it up to where it needed to be. Yes, and I welcome. am even more grateful for this plan going forward to make sure we don't end yeah, yeah, Thank I think so a lot much. of people will be happy about that, the, the long-term effects of what we've done, so. Thank you. Yeah. City Manager, this is a good chance to compliment the fine work of your staff. <laughs> yeah, I, I always have to applaud the efforts of our city staff and our coordination with our contractors. And just to also applaud our city council of past, present, and future, of putting in the stormwater and um, utility fee that really helped us have a very progressive edge on mitigating the risk of flood in our community. Good job. Okay, uh, if there are no other questions, I'll put this out to uh, public comment. Are there any members of the public that would like to comment on this agenda item? Yes, sir. About six months ago, or eight months ago, thereabouts, there was a whole big hullabaloo about the canals and the sea walls and all of that. And people got up and said, well, you know, I'm paying more money in taxes and everything else. Well, I remember asking a question, whose responsibility is it to fix the sea walls or to fix the canals because there's, I don't know how many people live on the water, but even if there was 30,000 people, even if there was 30,000, why should 65,000 people who don't live on the water, why should we have to pay for this? Again, I keep asking the same question tonight. I'm going to be saying this in my sleep. 
did we f suddenly find like a bag of money somewhere that we don't know what to do with and we got to spend it? Because nobody, again, has said how much this one project cost. Did it cost $100,000? Did it cost $500,000? Did it cost a million dollars? Oh, folks, nobody knows. So it would be nice, would be nice, if before they go out and they do a project, they let the residents know this is what's going to happen and this is how much it's going to cost. Not that you're going to listen to us, but that's been proven before. But again, my wife says to me, what do you care about? They all got to pay the same increase in taxes as you do. That's not the point. The point is you want to be transparent and you want to be upfront. Well, let the, the grunts in the trenches know how much something's going to cost. Now, if we fix this canal, how many more canals are we going to fix? And again, it doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect the vice mayor because he don't live in that city. He don't even live near water. I don't live near water. The hell do I care if the canals break? I don't own a boat. But yet, I got to pay for a canal. Why? Somebody please explain to me why the people who don't have anything to do with water, why do we have to pay for a problem with water? Thank That's you. That's all I want to know. Thank you. And I'll ask uh, City Manager um, when you can just to review the stormwater mitigation um, canal system that Palm Coast uh, has used since, since it was uh, incorporated uh, with the resident. Thank you. Um, are there any other members of the public that would like to speak on this agenda item at this time? Seeing none approach, I will close public comment. Or second. I have a motion to approve and a second. Um, would you, um, any other discussion? Vice Mayor Branquino? Yes. Council Member Danko? Yes. Council Member Finelli? Yes. Council Member Klufus? Yep. Mayor Alton? And yes. Motion passes 5 to 0. I'll ask the City Attorney to uh, read the next item into the record, please. Yes. The next item is the pre treatment, a resolution for the pre treatment affluent pumping tank pump panel assemblies, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Coast, Florida, approving the price agreement with Alpha General Services, Inc authorizing the city manager or designee to execute said agreement, providing for separability, providing for conflicts, <clears throat> providing for implementing actions, and providing for an effective date. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Steve Flanagan, your utility director. Our wastewater system has two main delivery methods. The first method is by gravity. The second method is by what is commonly known these days around here as our PEP system or pretreatment effluent pumping system. The main components of that <coughs> system on the lot of the customer is the tank, the pump, the pump vault, and the panel that attaches to the homeowner's home. Uh, working with our contracts and purchasing team, uh, the city bid out the components of the PEP system recently and received a low bid from Alpha General Services. This item is a recommendation to approve that bid of Alpha General Services. And I'd be glad to try and answer any questions you might have about it. Any questions from uh, the city council? We need these panel assemblies, right? Yep, that makes sense. Bill House is going up there. Yep. No questions. Mr. Finelli? Nope. Okay, I, I have no questions at this time. Um, <clears throat> open up public comment. Are there any members of the public that would like to comment on this agenda item at this time? 
Seeing no one approach, I'll close public comment and I will bring it back to City Council. Any additional questions for staff? I have a motion to approve. I'll second it. And I have a second. Any further discussion? The clerk would call, please. Vice Mayor Brinquino? Yes. Council Member Danko? Yes. Council Member Finelli? Yes. Council Member Klufus? Aye. Mayor Alfred? Yes. Motion passes five. I would ask uh, City Council to read the next um, and final resolution item into the record, please, for this evening. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, um, Council. Yes. <clears throat> and um, if I may, if we begin to run a little bit late, I'm going to ask for a consensus that we power through the rest of the agenda. Um, we have a hard stop, supposedly at Your Council policy and procedures says um, if Council wishes to continue beyond 11 p.m. Uh, you need approval of the majority of the council. A new time limit must be established um, by council vote to extend the meeting in the event that the meeting um, has not been adjourned or continued by a vote prior to 11 p.m. The items not acted on are to be continued at 9 a.m. the following day. So <clears throat> I'm just doing this in advance. I don't want anybody to rush through the tail end of the agenda. So I guess I will ask for a I do want pass. to let council also know tomorrow morning code enforcement board is scheduled for 10 a.m. So we would have to um, just make some adjustments in the schedule. All right, so I'm going to make a motion that we, if necessary, we continue the uh, meeting until 1130. I'll second it. I have a second. Oh. I have a motion and a second to continue this meeting until 1130. Uh, I don't have to take it out there. So. All in favor. Absolutely. All in favor. Aye. 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 This party Everybody doesn't stop. Let's go. Okay. Motion passes. Motion passes. Thank you. <laughs> we don't have the time. Let's go. Is this going to be a long person? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. <laughs> thank you, Mayor. I'll go ahead and read that. The last item on the resolution agenda for the White View Flyover Kings Business Center LLC Land Exchange Agreement, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Palm Coast, Florida, approving a land exchange agreement with Kings Business Center LLC, providing for severability, providing for conflict, providing for implementing actions, and providing for an effective date. Thank you, Mayor. City Council, as you recall, at the June 14th uh, workshop, we talked about a um, a flyover from Whiteview Parkway to Old Kings Road. It was actually approved in 2004. There was a deed provided to us for a potential flyover. Uh, we presented to you at City Council that um, you know our staff has looked at the, pro the uh, proposal that was brought to us by the uh, owner's rep representative. All of staff, our engineering division, our planning division, um, capital projects, we, we looked at it and thought it was a very reasonable proposal. In fact, that there are some advantages to what's existing, to what is proposed, and that, just to remind you from the workshop, that it impacts a significantly lot less uh, wetlands. Uh, it significantly uh, impacts less of the raffle infiltration basin or rib site uh, property, and um, it doesn't bisect the parcels. So we are here. Uh, we can go through a short presentation if you like, Mayor, but I think th that's the summary. Uh, there was nothing added or anything asked upon us at, at the City Council workshop. We're ready for action and uh, here for questions. Thank you, Mr. Tyner. I would invite uh, city council members now to ask questions of city staff. Uh, if you need a refresher or just a question on the, uh, on the item itself. Um, no councilman, councilman, Everyone? vice mayor. No, no, not, no, no. I, I, the questions I had is because I didn't know what was, this was for off the word, but uh, okay. no, I, I voted for it, yes. So, so. if there are no, <laughs> If there are no questions, I will invite the public to participate. If any member of the public has a comment that they would like to address to City Council, please come forward at this time. Seeing no one approach, I will close uh, public comment. Any further discussion by City Council? I would ask for a motion. A motion. I have a motion. Seconded. And I have a second. Any additional discussion? So I will ask for a roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Brinquino? Be consistent, yes. Council Member Danko? Yes. 
Council Member Finelli? Yes. Council Member Klufus? Affirmative. Mayor Alfred? Yes. Motion passes five to zero. So that brings us down the agenda to the final public participation. Have I missed anything, uh, the clerk? You're good. So I would invite any members of the public to comment on any item that was not previously covered in the agenda or spoken about in the introductory public comments. question actually I know I'm supposed to address the the mayor but I think his question has to go to the city attorney when a bid gets put in by anybody and there's going to be an awarding of something like there was tonight with the garbage collection does anybody from the city or anybody from the city attorney go over the contract to make sure that every question was answered equally by both parties. Because Councilman McCoopus, who is kid over here, he's figuring it out in metrics and this and that. And he's showing it, he's telling everybody that there's a mistake. Well, if there's a mistake, then the contract should become null and void if there was a mistake. Now, the city attorney says, no, everything was according to the book. Well, obviously, according to Councilman Koufos, it didn't go by the book. So how can you then award a contract to anybody if Column A is different than column B. I don't understand. So somebody has to explain to me if there's a discrepancy, and he shows you in black and white almost where the discrepancy is. And the city attorney, who's very smart, she turns around and says, there's no mistake. Well, you know what, kid? I'm going with the kid. Kid is showing you there's a mistake here. <clears throat> so if there was a mistake, then why didn't the city attorney pick it up? Because it should have never got this far. Because they should have taken the, the they should have taken the contract and ripped it up. Because everybody's playing by not the same rules. And now I don't care one way or the other. My garbage is going to get picked up. But I just want everybody to be treated fair and honestly. And so now there's a discrepancy between the city attorney and the kid. Somebody's right, somebody's wrong. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public that would like to make comment at this time? Then I will close this portion of the meeting for public comment. And we will move on to discussion by city council members of items that were not on this evening's agenda. Um, yes, does sir. All right, I don't, have much. I don't have much. The only thing I have is congratulate Mr. John Simpson, Simmons. Congratulations on your new job, your new position, and uh, when you see Brian McMillan for me, tell him I'll be missing him. Okay? Thank you very much. And by the way, great job at the uh, 4th of July uh, fireworks, and the whole thing was pretty good. Uh, uh, Council, I did like your hat and uh, the <laughs> fact that you took your kids over there. You made it a family event. Thank you very much. Very good. Councilman? Yes. Uh, two things, uh, just for clarification. I wasn't saying there was a mistake made, Mr. McDonald, just that uh, <clears throat> what adjustments they would have needed to be able to run the arithmetic to be able to get them to come in as the higher bidder. I wasn't accusing of any nefarious actions or anything like that. 
Um, the second uh, matter that I would like to address, I had uh, been away, I was in uh, Long Island, and I was watching the previous council meetings, and I saw what transpired with uh, the Green Lion, and I uh, got feedback from uh, our city manager and what exactly the direction of the council was, and I'm just, I wish I, I wish I'd been present to advocate a little bit more on the behalf of this community asset, and what I'm asking for tonight is just uh, to realize that this is a little bit more of an asset to Palm Coast than just the actual Green Lion. There's a tremendous following that is uh, the golfers of Palm Coast, and there's going to be a there's going to be a lot of kerfuffle made of this. And I just think that we have an opportunity to get ahead of something here. Where tonight we saw what happens when a award, uh, intent to award, is given to a, a similar you know operation like the garbage. Um, sanitary uh, services that were spoken about tonight. I think if our best case scenario is we get another uh, restaurant in there that is you know, as qualified, as capable, and adds the same allure to the golf course, we're still going to have all of this unnecessary um, friction that's going to occur between now and then. And um, I would like to make a motion that we extend the Green Lion's ability to sign that contract to a time certain of our next council business meeting. Um, and I would like to have a workshop sit down with them just for like an hour so we can all hash this out because when I, I left an, our May meeting, we gave them pretty clear direction on how to come to the uh, conclusion of a contract signing, but we just, I'm not certain why they didn't sign this and I'm, I'm not certain that the direction that we gave was clear enough that there wasn't all these additional things that got added along the way, I think both people and both parties, I should say, felt a little bit wronged. And there's no doubt in my mind that they should have continued communications with the city. That was, you know, not the correct move. But I think as a council, we can see that there's going to be a firestorm that's coming our way if we don't at least give them a, a chance to try to uh, plead their case and come to a more amicable solution. Um, so again, I'd like to make a motion that we extend the Green Lion's ability to sign this contract for time certain until our next uh, business workshop. I said business meeting, but uh, workshop. And then we invite them in for a, um, an agenda item to give them the chance to actually uh, respond uh, whereas prior they were just on public comment and that's my motion before you continue with the motion um, <clears throat> counselor um, is this a proper procedure before I ask if there's a second well what we have right now the motion that was approved and the direction that was given on this matter at the last meeting was to give the Green Lion 10 days to sign the contract as approved by City Council. So City Council has approved the contract that staff was, that, that staff prepared, and that if they don't sign, then staff would go out to the, to the RFP process to find, um, you know, work on that. Well, that a termination letter would be sent to the Green Lion, I apologize first, consistent with the agreement, the current agreement with them, and that then city staff would go out to RFP to, you know, allow for others, including the Green Line, to be able to um, put their proposals in to occupy that space. So, so there that's the direction city staff has right now. There's nothing that says with the majority of city council vote that, that the direction can't be changed in some way, um, but the time frame for that signature that was given by the last motion has elapsed. Now the city council didn't give direction on, you know, okay, then within five days after that, you know, for example, the termination has to, letter has been sent. That's, there wasn't direction given as to that. It, it was just the next step would be to send the termination letter and then you know, get the RFP out to get someone else in. So, so I understand Sorry, your... Sorry, Mayor, I cut you off. That's okay, no, no. So, so I understand your comment that <clears throat> with respect to Councilman Klufus's uh, motion, there is nothing to prevent the current vendor from going through the RFP process and potentially winning a continuation of the business. Um, is that correct? Of, of course, nothing would preclude the Green Lion from going through that process again. 
which I'm thinking, and again, um, I haven't asked for a second, so we haven't gotten to discussion yet, so if you just permit me, um, Councilman Klufus, with your motion, does that provide the time that you might be looking for? Um, the question I have is, <clears throat> if there is in fact a defect um, in the business model, and there's a issue of profitability on, be on behalf of the, the vendor, um, it seems to me that that could be well vetted out during the the subsequent RFP process. Does that, does that satisfy where you're going with this and would you be willing to withdraw the motion? Um, it's up to you. Sure, I'm, I'm hoping that we can realize that they've been a tremendous partner from beginning when we tried to overhaul the golf course and I would like to give them just one more opportunity, at least a fair shake at speaking to our, our city council because I felt like we had given direction on the previous meetings that hey, we, we came to terms, you know, Basically, I felt like we had a handshake deal when they left in that at the end of the May meeting. And I, I can't speak for them, obviously, but my position is that I thought we had agreements and then they came back and they said, hey, you know, there's uh, amendments for taxation, additional uh, water utilization, the personnel uh, clause, I understand, uh, as far as liability for um, city workers. But at the end of the day, I felt like we had an agreement and then there were things added and then we didn't and then they weren't given their last chance to like make their case. And I, I'm sure they feel correctly or incorrectly, they feel wrong, but I just feel like being a, a community partner in an opportunity like we have now, before we make it through, all the way through the RFP process, we can extend one final olive branch and, and have the city come out on the right side of this versus being portrayed as kicking them out of Palm Harbor Golf Course. And I, I, I'm unsure whether this will be fruitful or not, but. I just wish that I had been present to kind of advocate for this, but I, I'm pretty sure that what happened is that we're just all misaligned, like I explained. So I, I would like to hold the motion. I would like to give them one more chance to be the good community partner that they had signed up for and to move this forward. All right, so there's a motion on the dais. Um, I will ask, is there a second to the motion? I will second it for conversation. I, I'd like to have that conversation. Um, I, I'm disappointed that they quit negotiating two weeks prior to that meeting. There was an opportunity to resolve all of this before it came to us. And um, I was disappointed in that. I too was going to advocate more for them, but that's, that's not where we were at at the last meeting, yep. un unfortunately. Um, so I, it's something that I've thought a lot about. Um, and truly, I don't think it's, it's a, it's not about the green line and whether you like the service or the food or this or that, it's about we have a lease for a building and we have to do something that is in the best interest of the citizens of Palm Coast. With that being said, the current establishment does provide a good service to the citizens of Palm Coast. Um, so I, I, I've, this one has bothered me quite a bit. Um, I, I'd like to hear what rest of council there. you know we saw a lot of people from waste pro come in here tonight to voice their concerns yeah none of them were disrespectful even after this thing was over they left peacefully yep. disappointed obviously but they 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 didn't cause a ruckus the treatment we were subject to by the Marlows the last time they were here is inexcusable I'm sorry I can't support yep. I just can't support this, Nick, and I'm sorry, but I think we now can go through that process and let's see what happens. They certainly can come and bid, but you can't come in here shouting and screaming and causing a scene. Vice Mayor almost had um, Chris Marlowe escorted out of this building. And, and I'm actually, you showed a lot of restraint, but that's because you were a police officer and, and, and you have that ability. I, I, I don't have that kind of restraint, but I was never a police officer. But I'm sorry, Nick, I can't support you. No, understood. Vice Mayor. Oh, sorry, no, if I may. Uh, uh, the mayor was right on the comments to give him three minutes. If they wanted more than three minutes, all they have to do is say, I have a presentation. Then they could talk as long as they want. Okay? The other thing is talking about respect. We were all labeled as crooks over here. He called us all crooks. Okay? Uh, if there's one thing I don't enjoy, it's being labeled. Not at this stage of my life, trust me. I didn't respect. And I still think that what's separating 
either the Green Lion or any other company, I'll call it company, or a restaurant or whatever you want to call it, that comes in is the water meter. Because, and that, uh, I had a call, I don't know if I could say the name of the person, Mr. Hayes, okay, calls me, and for the first time in decades, I had to hang up the phone on this gentleman. This gentleman used to be a controller for the, for the, the Marlins. And he calls me, and you have to say that I was spitting at the phone. That's how infuriated I was, what this gentleman had to say. And of course, there was people behind listening to the conversation. So Mr. Hayes, if you're listening to this conversation, do not disrespect me the way you did. I don't appreciate it. And I still think that we should do what we should do. We should protect the people of Palm Coast. We got to do what's best for them. And I hope that what's best for them, for the, the, the people of Palm Coast, it's also the best for the Marlos, which, by the way, I have no idea where they were. I had no problem with them until last week. Okay? After being called a crook by this gentleman, I dislike him personally. But that's a different story, and I don't like to go behind anybody and talk in their back. What I have to say, I'll say it here to the face of the people. Okay? So uh, that still will not affect my judgment when it comes to what's proper for the people of Palm Coast. I still think that, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, in the future, Mr. Jason DeLorenzi, together probably with the, with the, building, with the building, building's manager, should go and try to do what I had proposed, which is get the meter just for one, uh, uh, one of the, the, the modules. Get the, the, the kitchen, that's it. I think that due to the fact that we share the bathrooms with the, the golf course and the restaurant share the bathrooms, no problem. We will eat the water, when I mean, we'll eat the cost of the water, but still, we're not gonna give them water for free or any, I don't think we should give anybody any, any of the, the, the amenities, uh, I mean, excuse me, the, the blank. Utilities. The utilities uh, for free. Now, if we have to work something on a monthly payment, it's something else, but, uh, any other contracts that we're going to uh, work on has to be based on utilities. Pay your utilities and then we'll work on a contract. That's the way it should be done. Okay. So my final comment is <clears throat> I would certainly encourage um, the, um, the, um, the Green Lion to um, apply uh, for the RFP process, uh, giving us the opportunity to vet, make sure that the business model is both profitable for them, as um, I assume it has been, and also is um, um, conscious of the taxpayers' dollars, which have subsidized the, uh, the property for some time. Um, that was the net zero argument. So again, I would encourage them to um, enjoy the process, and uh, if they are the best service, and if they are the best business model, then they certainly will, you know, win the business, uh, win the RFP. So that's what it is. So we have a motion. Um, we have a second. Uh, does your second hold? Or you need to draw it. Yes. Okay. Then I will um, um, call for the vote. Councilmember Danko? No. Councilmember Finelli? Yes. Councilmember Klufus? Aye. Mayor Alfin? No. Motion fails three to two. Next item, um, are there any other uh, matters for City Council to bring up that were yeah, not on the I agenda this evening? Yeah, I just want to give a really great shout out to our fire department and to Animal Control on June 24th. You guys rescued this kitten. Uh, that was trapped in this uh, engine compartment of a car. Nice. Uh, what a great thing. It was just beautiful to see a beautiful kitten. Named it Turbo. Um, I hope that we have found a home for that kitten. Do we know, uh, I would ask our city manager or our soon-to-be chief, do we know if they found a home? P please do, please do, because I might know some people that might want that kitten. But thank you, thank your folks, thank Thank you to Animal Control. It's good to read something like that. Thank you. That's all I have. Councilman, last comment? 
Fireworks over the runway, amazing event. Yeah. Thank you to everybody that, that put that together. Um, what an enjoyable night for, for me and my family and my extended family that came out. Um, just couldn't ask for a better event. Um, thank you to everybody that, that worked to put that together. Sure. My final comment is I just, uh, just a reminder that the Foodathon, the million dollar Foodathon, will take place uh, on the radio this coming Friday. Um, call ins are welcome for those that would like to um, make sure that every belly is fed in Flagler County for the rest of this year. It is a chance for this community to come together to collaborate on one single thing that I know we will be successful at, that we can point back together and say, look what we can do when we work together. So I just a reminder for everyone. And with that, does city attorney have any final comments? That's city manager. No, I have nothing further. City manager. I have nothing. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Thank you.